Okay, it's 10 o'clock. Um, good morning. I would like to call this public meeting, public hearing to order. My name is Gabriel Jakevich. I'm a member of the Commission on Chicago Landmarks and I will be the hearing officer for today's hearing. Also here today is Michael Gaynor, who is the Commission's counsel for today's public hearing. This hearing will be conducted per the emergency rules governing the conduct of remote public hearings issued by the chairman of the Commission on Chicago Landmarks of the City of Chicago in accordance with the chairman's emergency rulemaking powers pursuant to that certain rule adopted by the commission pursuant to a resolution at the commission's regular meeting on June 4th, 2020. The emergency rule resolution can be found at www chicago.gov slash ccl the emergency rules these emergency rules governing the conduct of remote public hearings were effective as of Ju july 27th 2020 and shall remain in effect until there is no longer a disaster proclamation issued by the governor of the state of illinois or the director of the illinois department of public health relating to public health concerns for cook county as such, these emergency rules shall be repealed uh, of their own accord. The chairman may rescind, suspend, or amend these emergency rules as circum circumstances dictate. During the period the emergency rules are in effect, they supersede any conflicting rules and regulations regarded, regarding the conduct of public hearings on designations or permit applications under section 2-120-800 and 2-120-820 of the Chicago Landmarks Ordinance, as such rules and regulations are set forth in the commission's rules, including but not limited to Article 4 and 5 of the regular rules. The purpose of these emergency rules is to permit the commission to conduct public hearings on permit applications under sections 2-120-800 and 2 120 Dash 820 of the Chicago Landmarks Ordinance while taking appropriate measures to, to measures consistent with the guidance from the City Council, the Governor, United States Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the Illinois Department of Public Health, and the Chicago Department of Public Health to mitigate the contagion and spread of the COVID-19 virus. These emergency rules address the manner in which the commission will conduct public hearings on permit applications under sections 2-120-800 and 2-120-820 of the, of the Chicago Landmarks Ordinance to comply with the recommended social distancing and social isolation practices to mitigate contagion and protect and promote the health and well-being of the general public, commission staff, and members of the commission. I will briefly summarize the nature of today's hearing. The Commission on Chicago Landmarks was established and is governed by the Municipal Code of Chicago. The procedures for today's public hearing are contained in Article 5 of the Commission's Rules and Regulations governing hearings for expedited consideration of proposed landmarks and permit applications. The purposes and duties of the commission are set forth in the municipal code and include the identification, preservation, protection, enhancement, and encouragement of the continued use and rehabilitation of buildings and districts having special historical community architectural or aesthetic interests to the city of Chicago and its citizens. The commission carries out this mandate by recommending to the city council the designation of specific building structures, areas, districts, and works of art as official Chicago landmarks. The commission bases its recommendation on the seven criteria set forth in section 2-120-620 of the municipal code and the integrity criterion set forth in section 2-120-630 of the municipal code. In order to ensure the preservation and enhancement of, of landmarks, the commission reviews and approves or disapproves permit applications for alterations to individual landmarks and contributing buildings within landmark districts, including demolition. The purpose of today's hearing is twofold. First, to gather relevant facts and information to assist the commission in deciding whether the proposed former Schlitz Brewery Tide House at 1393 to 1399 West Lake meets the criteria for landmark designation. And second, 
to determine whether the proposed demolition of the building is contrary to the criteria of Article 3, Section G.3A of the Rules and Regulations and, and per Section G.3B and is a per se adverse effect on the significant historical and architectural features. Pursuant to Article 5G of the Commission rules, the Commission's rules and regulations, I've decided to hold the landmark designation portion of the hearing first, followed by the permit application portion. If necessary, I may call for a break at some point during today's hearing. And if I do this, I'll announce the time um, that the hearing will reconvene. So um, we will begin with a chronology of events leading to the public hearing and incorporate the commission's exhibits into the record. Then I'd like to call on Michael Gaynor. Again, this is Michael Gaynor with the City of Chicago Law Department acting as a counsel to the commission and to the hearing officer for this morning's hearing. Uh, chronology of events and incorporation of commission's exhibits into the record. On December 2nd, 2020, Commission on Chicago Landmarks staff received a wrecking permit application, number 100901650 for the former Schlitz Brewery Tide House at 1393 to 1399 West Lake Street, the building. A copy of the wrecking permit application is identified as Commission Exhibit 1. Per Municipal Code Section 14A-4-407.6 through 14A-4-407.7, the 90-day demolition delay process was thereby triggered and a copy of the notice sent to the owner dated December 2nd, 2020 is included as Commission Exhibit 2. A letter sent from the applicant's attorney dated January 22nd, 2021, requesting a 30-day extension of the demolition delay through March 30, 2021, as well as the Commission's letter dated January 26, 2021, approving that request, are included as Commission Exhibit 3. A letter sent from the applicant's attorney, attorney dated February 22nd, 2021, requesting a second 30-day extension of demolition delay through April 30, 2021, as well as the commission's letter dated February 22nd, 2021, approving that request, are identified as Commission Exhibit 4. Commission staff's courtesy letter dated March 11, 2021, is included as Commission Exhibit 5. This letter was mailed to the applicant and emailed to the applicant and the applicant's team, notifying them that preliminary landmark designation and the permit application for demolition would be included in the April 1, 2021 Commission on Chicago Landmarks meeting agenda and the consequent requirement per section 2-120-820 of the Municipal Code for expedited consideration of the designation and permit should the commission vote to approve the designation and deny the permit application. The proposed preliminary designation and permit application for demolition were placed on the April 1, 2021 agenda of the regular monthly meeting of the Commission on Chicago Landmarks. The staff presentation for the designation is included as Commission Exhibit 6. The recommendation for preliminary designation of the building is identified as Commission Exhibit 7. The preliminary sum summary of information dated April 2021 included as part of that recommendation is identified as Commission Exhibit 8. Public comments received regarding the proposed designation and demolition are identified as Commission Exhibit 9. The staff report and presenta presentation for the permit application for demolition are included as Exhibit 10. On April 1, 2021, the Commission voted to approve the uh, preliminary designation of the building. They subsequently voted to preliminarily disapprove the permit application for demolition based on the commission's findings that A, the significant historical or architectural features of the building are all exterior elevations, including roof lines, excluding the non-historic one-story frame structure with fabric roof and vestibule at the building's rear. And B, the demolition of the building, a proposed landmark, is contrary to the criteria of Article 3, Section G3A of the Rules and Regulations and per Section G3B is a per se adverse effect on the significant historical and architectural features of the property. A letter dated April 12, 2021 
was sent via certified mail to the applicant and emailed to the applicant and the applicant's team. The letter notified the applicant of the preliminary designation, preliminary decision on the demolition, and the schedule of a public hearing on May 12, 2021. Along with proof, the letter, uh, along with proof that the letter was sent via certified mail with return receipt requested, are identified as Commission Exhibit 11. Notice of the hearing was posted at two locations outside the building, and an affidavit and dated photographs from Emily Barton of the Commission on Chicago Landmark staff confirming that the sign was installed at 1393 1399 West Lake Street on April 25th, 2021, are identified as Commission Exhibit 12. A legal notice for the public hearing was published in the Chicago Sun-Times on April 20th, 2021, and the certificate of publication from the Sun-Times attesting thereto is identified as Commission Exhibit 13. The public hearing notice was also posted on the Department of Planning and Department of Development's website and a printout uh, is included as Commission Exhibit 14. Um, thank you. Next, I will rule on request for party status. Any owner? Uh, Commissioner? Commissioner? Oh, yes. I think you first need to uh, incorporate uh, the foregoing documents into the record. <laughs> thank you. Um, I would, thank you, Michael. I would like to incorporate these documents into the Commission of the commission into the record. The commission's documents are available for inspection via email request. Um, thank you. I will I will now rule on um, request for party status. Um, any owner any owner of the property is eligible to participate as a party in the, in this designation proceeding. In addition, the following individuals and organizations are eligible to participate as parties. Um, first. Those who use uh, those who use and enjoy or enjoyment, or whose members use and enjoyment of the proposed landmark, may be injured by the designation or the failure to, de to designate. And second, those who own, lease, or reside in property located within 500 feet of the property line of the of the proposed designation. Parties have the right to make presentations that include photographs and other documents as well as testimony from witnesses. Parties also have the right to question other witnesses about their testimony and commission staff and experts about the preliminary landmark recommendation. Please note, however, that party status is not required if a property owner or other individual organization eligible to participate as a party only wishes to make a statement for or against the proposed designation Everyone will have an opportunity to make a statement during the public statement portion of the hearing. In addition, property owners within the district have the right to question commission staff and experts, regardless of whether they are parties to the proceeding. That said, those wishing to request party status were required to file an appearance form no later than 10 days prior to the public hearing. And I have received two appearance forms requesting party status, one from the property owner's representative and one from the Department of Planning and Development. And I've decided to grant both um, party status. We will now hear a presentation by Candle and Han of the commission staff summarizing the preliminary landmark recommendation for the former Schlitz Brewery Tide House at 1393 to 1399 Westlake. Kendallin, you're on mute. Good morning. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, uh, Kamal, can you please allow me to share my screen? Yes, it's done. Thank you. Are you able to see that screen? Uh, no, not yet. Okay. Now it's coming up. Okay, great. We good? Yeah, we see you. 
Okay, great. Thank you very much. So good morning. My name is Candelyn Hahn, and I am a project coordinator for the Historic Preservation Division in the Department of Planning and Development. Our division supports the Commission on Chicago Landmarks. Let's see if I can get this moving. There we go. The subject property is located in the near West Side neighborhood. The structure is located at the southeast corner of Lake and Loomis Streets. Research confirmed that 1393 to 1399 West Lake was built as a Schlitz Brewery Tide House. Brewery Tide Houses were buildings commissioned and owned by breweries built between the 1890s and 1910s, which housed bars selling only the alcohol produced by that brewer. Many breweries utilized this approach amidst increasing competition and pricing wars, but Schlitz had the largest number of Tide Houses in Chicago. In 2011, the Commission on Chicago Landmarks approved the landmark designation of nine former Schlitz Brewery Tide House structures, including one former Schlitz Brewery stable building. More recently in 2020, the Commission approved the landmark designation of a 10th former Schlitz Brewery Tide House structure at 9401 South Ewing Avenue. The 10 buildings located on the north, south, and west sides of Chicago are shown on this slide. Based on evaluation of the 1393 to 99 West Lake property, the Commission on Chicago Landmarks preliminarily found that the former Schlitz Brewery Tide House meets at 1393 West Lake meets three criteria for Chicago Landmark designation, including criterion one for heritage. The origins of the saloon in Chicago go back to the city's days as a pioneer settlement in the 1830s, when alcohol was sold at inns or taverns, which also provided dining and typically lodging. Examples of these early drinking establishments include the Green Tree Tavern and the Saganash Hotel, both originally located near the fork of the Chicago River. As the city's population grew in the 19th century, so did the number of drinking establishments, then known as saloons. Prior to the arrival of the brewery tide houses, Chicago saloons were usually architecturally indistinguishable from other neighborhood storefront buildings. These early saloons were mom and pop businesses owned by independent saloon keepers who bought their beer from the brewery offering the lowest wholesale price, resulting in cutthroat competition and lower profits for brewers. Breweries in Chicago also began as small ventures, much like this frame building at upper left, which housed John Huck's Brewery in Chicago in 1847, the first brewery to make lager beer in the city. The Lill and Diversi Brewery traced its origins to the 1830s and is considered the first commercial brewery in Chicago. In 1839, their plant was installed in a small tenement building at Pine and Chicago Streets. By 1861, the brewery was producing 45,000 barrels of beer a year and employing over 75 men. By 1866, the brewery had expanded to cover an entire block and the water tower pumping station, which still stands today, was put in directly across the street from the brewery. The company's most famous product was Lil's Cream Ale. However, the Great Fire of 1871 wiped the brewery out and the owners never rebuilt. Although other breweries rebounded after the fire, for a time, the city subsisted on beer sent from Milwaukee, allowing Schlitz's business to double by 1872. Despite outside competitors like Schlitz, the local brewing industry was an important part of Chicago's economy. By 1885, there were 33 breweries employing 2,000 people in Chicago, and the city ranked sixth in the nation in beer production. Most Chicago breweries were founded and managed by German immigrants, uh, many of whom became prominent businessmen active in the city's affairs, such as Peter Schoenhofen, Joseph Theurer, Francis Dues, Conrad Seip, Fridolin Madliner, and Michael Brandt. 
Edward G. Uline had overseen the distribution of Schlitz beer after the Chicago fire as the manager of Schlitz's Chicago operations. As vice president of the company in the 1890s, when the company turned to a new vehicle for selling their product, the Tidehouse system, Uline set out to find suitable locations. Uline was a German immigrant who arrived in the U.S. as a young man in 1863, eventually making his way to Chicago as the owner of a small but successful metal manufacturing company by the 1870s. Decades earlier, his uncle had begun a brewery in the basement of a successful restaurant in Milwaukee. Joseph Schlitz married into the family and changed the name of the brewery, and upon his death in 1875, controlling ownership passed to Edward Uline's brothers, who had been working in the brewing industry in St. Louis. One of the earlier properties purchased by Uline was 1393 West Lake Street. The Chicago Tribune notice announces the sale of a 22 foot by 25 foot lot to Uline on March 16, 1891. A permit was issued for a construction of a four story store and flats building in 1892 to the Joseph Schlitz Brewing Company. This 1892 Rasher insurance map confirms the structure was completed that year. As with other Schlitz Brewery Tide Houses, 1393 was located on the corner of a highly traveled east-west thoroughfare of the city, Lake Street. Uh, you'll see that the uh, 1393 is circled in red right there. Edward Uline would have known that the Lake Street Elevated was under construction, and one year after his building went up, the Sheldon Station would deposit travelers directly in front of the building. Ready access to such efficient transportation would allow the transformation to a more industrial area already underway in this part of Chicago to accelerate as workers could more easily access this stretch of the near west side. The Tide House would provide another reason for people to frequent this commercial node, which already had 10 stores, all marked by a red star in the image above. The sites chosen for Schlitz Brewery Tide Houses were a reflection of Chicago's expanding population and infrastructure, as Edward Uline sought out real estate at neighborhood locations which were easily accessible by public transportation and had a concentration of workers. Tide House structures also represented several important narratives from Chicago's history and that of the larger United States in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The prominence of the brewing industry in Chicago and Milwaukee was made possible by those cities' access to grain markets, fresh water, supplies of natural ice, and transportation. The beer sold in Tide Houses reflected the increasing role of science and technology in the transformation of local crafts into larger industries. The photo at the upper left shows the Siebel Brewing Academy, established in Chicago in 1868, a vocational school focused on brewing education and services still in operation today. Edward Uline's immigration to the United States relates the story of German immigrants as both leaders of the brewing industry and as consumers, and their larger role in the economic, architectural, cultural, and social aspects of Chicago's and the nation's development. At lower left in the image is the Germania Club building, which served as a focal point for Chicago's German American community, where cultural, charitable, and civic activities took place. At the turn of the 20th century, Germans were the city's most populous ethnic group. The Tide Houses themselves evolved as a competitive solution by brewers to find outlets for their product in Chicago. And as such, they reflected the rise of vertically integrated production and retail sales and the increasing competition among businesses as Chicago grew. The role of the saloon in neighborhoods is also illustrated through Tide Houses. Saloons served as informal community centers where immigrants could hear news, ask about jobs, and decide who they might vote for, often in their native language. The centrality of Tide Houses and the lives of immigrants was affirmed when, backed by the deeper pockets of large brewers, Tide Houses provided free lunches as a draw for customers. By 1900, a survey found that Tide Houses provided more food to Chicagoans than the combined efforts of the city's hunger charities. As the cartoon at the upper right notes, saloons became the poor man's equivalent of a club. 
Men's clubs were institutions that catered exclusively to men and excluded women, as was the case with saloons. Women became the driving force behind the temperance movement in reaction to the ills associated with the prevalence of alcohol sold at these establishments. Dry reformers pressured cities to exert some control over liquor sales by passing things like Sunday closure laws. The Commission on, oh, we go. The Commission on Chicago Landmarks also preliminarily found that the former Schlitz Brewery Tide House meets criterion four for exemplary architecture in its overall quality of design executed in traditional materials, including pressed brick, cut stone, cast iron, and pressed copper. Large breweries like Schlitz had the funds to purchase desirable property and build the kind of architecture they wanted. Designs for Schlitz Brewery Tide Houses incorporated high-end materials and often incorporated highly visible decorative elements. Typically, Tide Houses would concentrate the most elaborate decorative elements at the front facade, but the site characteristics of 1393 Lake Street called for a different approach. The elevated line directly in front of the structure obscured views of the facade from multiple angles. Although decorative and textured limestone were used on the front elevation, the more detailed copper work was featured on the bay window and corner turret where it could be seen to best advantage. Most Schlitz Brewery Tide Houses were designed in the Queen Anne style and later also the related German Renaissance Revival style. These styles shared an emphasis on prominent decoration and reaching back to historic styles for inspiration. The Tide House at 1393 employed the Queen Anne style, which emphasized asymmetric composition, often featuring turrets, towers, bay windows, and other prominent elements. This copper-clad bay window at left is at the west elevation and features scalloped patterns, floor rosettes, and lunettes over the windows with a fan motif. The anchor-like panels inserted on the, under the bracketed eaves wrap around both street-facing elevations. The original cast iron of the storefront opening shown at right includes piers with rosettes fit into a geometric pattern and filigree on curving projecting elements at top and bottom. The most striking feature of 1393 is perhaps the lone turret projecting from the corner. It rests atop a base supported by three curving medallion brackets extending from a central profiled cast iron column. The prominent corner locations chosen for Schlitz Brewery tide houses allowed entrances to be placed at the corners, which were often chamfered or cut back and emphasized with a dominant architectural element here by the corner turret. The Queen Anne style also emphasized variety using a mix of forms, colors, textures, and materials to create visual interest. This facade is clad with a mix of smooth and rough faced limestone, including a checkerboard spandrel panel. Fan design lunettes over windows seen in the turret continue at the front facade, as do large decorative metal panels under the eaves. Here, missing original panels have been replaced with the simplified version. Painted signage was also seen on Schlitz Brewery Tide Houses of every decade. At 1393, evidence of signage remains in the form of a ghost sign on the east elevation. Although often painted on finished elevations, site conditions likely led to at least one sign at 1393 being painted on the common brick east elevation, easily visible for some distance to the east and most definitely to passengers on the elevated trains. Although the Schlitz font logo remained a constant, some later Tide House signs incorporated Schlitz's belted globe logo. The globe logo was first used in 1892, but was not widely popularized until the design was featured in an exhibit at, the, at Chicago's 1893 World's Columbian Exposition. In time, the trademark or insignia of the brewing company rendered in carved stone, terracotta, or pressed metal also developed as a common decorative motif of Schlitz Brewery Tide Houses. The commission also preliminarily found that the property meets criterion six for distinctive theme expressed through distinctive buildings. The former Schlitz Brewery Tide House at 1393 West Lake is part of a larger group of Schlitz Brewery Tide House structures that together convey important aspects of Chicago and American history, including 
the rise of the Tidehouse system in Chicago, which reflects the economic might of brewing companies and the evolution of their commercial competition, reflecting broader patterns in US history. The role of immigration in brewing and ethnicity in beer consumption and the brewing industry's response to pressure from those who sought to limit alcohol consumption in American society. At left is a pamphlet from the Anti-Saloon League, one of the organizations formed to try to influence laws regulating alcohol. Dry reformers pressured cities to exert some control over liquor sales by passing things like Sunday closure laws. This article at right from 1916 lists the owner of the saloon at 1393 West Lake Street as one of the 17 whose licenses were revoked for illegally remaining open on a Sunday. Like many commercial property owners, breweries used attractive buildings to attract customers, but Tidehouse architecture was also emblematic of the brewing industry's response to increasing social pressure brought about by progressive reformers. Through their buildings, they tried to project a more respectable, socially responsible image amidst growing opposition to drinking establishments. Breweries took the store and flat building typically used for saloons and elevated it through the use of popular styles and a higher degree of craftsmanship in their tide houses. Chicago's Schlitz Brewery tide house structures represent a distinct building type with common characteristics. Although scattered throughout the city and built over the course of decades, they nevertheless retained remarkable uniformity in design, location, and intent. Rectangular in plan, tide houses typically measure 25 feet in width and range from 75 to 120 feet in depth. Tide houses were typically located on the corners of commercial streets, well served by the streetcar and elevated or and or elevated train lines. The primary entrance is usually located on the chamfered corner of the building, often marked with a projecting bay or turret above it. Edward Uline focused on purchasing locations for tide houses in neighborhoods where there were large population of populations of immigrants as a customer base. This building, shown in the slide, is located at the southeast corner of Ashland and Fulton. It is the only other very early Schlitz Brewery tide house we know of still standing in Chicago. It was built in 1891, and the painted Schlitz font logo is visible on the north elevation. At right is the building today, which has been altered significantly. By comparison, the Tide House at 1393 West Lake Street maintains a very high degree of integrity. So, in addition to the landmark criteria discussed, the Commission on Chicago Landmarks preliminarily found that 1393 West Lake Street also meets the separate integrity criterion. The 1393 West Lake is one of the few remaining and best preserved early examples of the Schlitz Brewery Tide House. The building underwent a restoration sometime after 1987. The roof was rebuilt and the copper treatment of the bay window and corner turret were brought back. The storefront system, windows and doors are not original, but these are considered reversible changes. Some areas of brick at the west elevation have been somewhat abraded a small portion of the storefront opening cast iron pieces are broken or rusted, and short sections of the above grade foundations show deterioration, none of which would be unusual or serious for a building of this age. So significant historical and architectural features proposed by the commission are all exterior elevations, including roof lines of the building, However, the non-historic one-story frame structure at the rear is excluded from the proposed designation. This concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hunt, for the presentation. Um, that concludes the staff's presentation. Candelyn Hahn and, and Matt Crawford, um, staff uh, of the Commission of Chicago Landmarks, are both here to take questions. Um, questions uh, must relate to whether the proposed designation meets the criteria for a landmark designation. And I would like to request that we limit the questioning uh, period to a maximum of 20 minutes. Um, we will begin by taking questions from the property owner or the representatives. Please state your name and whether you are the owner or in what capacity you represent the owner and the name of your company, if any. 
And I believe uh, uh, Ms. Barnes, if, if, would you like to proceed with any questions? Hello, Mr. Hearing Officer. Um, Sarah, for the record, my name is Sarah Barnes and I'm an attorney with the Losses of Sam Banks. And I am happy to be here this afternoon and morning on behalf of the um, owner and applicant. Um, I do not have any direct questions for staff at this time. Um, I would like to provide an opportunity to the actual property owner, Mr. One of the actual property owners, Mr. DeGraff, if he has any questions. I believe Mr. DeGraff has joined us and he has an appearance form on file. Yeah, uh, thank you, Sarah. Uh, I don't have any questions for the staff. I, I, whenever it is appropriate, I'll make a, a statement when, if, when we're putting on our matter, if that's appropriate. So if these are questions I, at this point, I don't have any uh, questions for the staff. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. And um, excuse me, Mr. Hearing Officer, um, would we have an opportunity after our presentation to do any sort of questions? Um, I believe so. Okay. You uh, am I correct in that, Michael? Well, you'll have the opportunity to question any witnesses that the department puts on. It's, then I do have one question um, since this is um, related to staff. I just um, wanted to ask and confirm that in or around April of 2016, a demolition permit was issued for the subject property and the subject improvements. Um, may I just confirm that with staff? Um, this is Candlin Hahn. Good morning, Sarah. Um, Good morning. My research into Hansen showed that no demolition permit was issued. I uh, contacted the Department of Buildings and uh, they confirmed that in 2016, no demolition permit was issued. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Does that uh, conclude your questions for staff? Um, yes, it does. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now uh, we'll take uh, questions from any parties who are not owners or owners representatives to whom I've granted party status. Uh, please state your name, uh, the organization or legal entity that you represent. Do we have any? Uh, folks who are not owners that are signed up uh, Uh, Commissioner, it's Bradley Wilson from the Law Department. Uh, I'm here in my capacity as a party with the Historic Preservation Division, but we, uh, we do not have any questions. Great, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> next, we will, we will have presentations by parties to whom I've granted party status. I would remind everyone at this time that the Commission's rules and regulations strictly limit presentations at the designation hearing to information relevant to whether the proposed designation meets the criteria for landmark designation set forth in the municipal code. Presentations may include a statement, documents, photographs, and testimony from witnesses. Presentations should not should be no long should be no longer than 20 minutes and may not include information relating to zoning concerns, permit applications, or potential economic hardship. The focus must be on landmark criteria. If I determine that information presented is not relevant to the landmark criteria, I will exclude such information from the record. Should any presentations include testimony from witnesses, then other parties, commission staff, and I may question the witnesses. Um, I don't believe uh, we have any parties uh, signed up in support, but. Uh, I believe that the Department of Planning uh, does not have any uh, press, uh, does not wish to make a presentation at this time, or, or do you? Um, not beyond what the staff has presented, Commissioner. We'll save it for the permit portion of the hearing. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then now we will hear uh, from the owner who is in opposition to the proposed designation. For the record, I would like to note that the owner has requested to submit a revision of their consultant's report and presentation after the submission deadline. Does 
council for uh, the Department of Planning and Development have any objections? And if yes, please state why. Uh, we have no objection, Commissioner, to using the revised report. Great. Um, seeing none, I have decided uh, to allow the admission of the revised report and presentation after the submission deadline. I would now like to call on Ms. Barnes. Thank you Thank so you. much once more, Mr. Officer, um, and esteemed members of the commission and staff. I want to begin by reiterating our gratitude to both the Department of Planning and Development and their historic preservation staff, as well as to Corporation Council, both Mr. Gaynor and Mr. Wilson for their continuing and ongoing courtesy and engagement throughout this process. Um, regardless of the outcome of these proceedings, we look forward to continuing to work with DPD and its staff towards um, any improvements for the property. Um, as a matter of introduction, here with me today virtually on behalf of the applicant is one of its managing members and a co-owner, Stephen DeGraff. As well, we have with us our um, very esteemed expert witness, George Kissel from Oakrent Kissel and Associates. Um, before I continue, Mr. Chairman, and just for a matter of housekeeping on the record, prior to this hearing and on behalf of ownership, I submitted certain disclosures to this honorable commission, copies of which were also exchanged electronically with corporation counsel as agreed to by the parties. These disclosures included without limitation, certain permit records affecting and related to the subject property, a letter of objection to the proposed landmark designation preferred by the, um, on behalf of ownership, a preliminary report prepared by Mr. Kissel along with a final and a supplemental report also prepared by Mr. Kissel and to a presentation package that will soon be shared by and through Mr. Kissel in furtherance and support um, of his findings and opinions. We believe that these documents and materials speak for themselves and we very respectfully request that they become a part of the record and a part of these proceedings accordingly. Great, and, and anything that uh, we present we'll be uh, labeling, as it, labeling it as an exhibit. Okay, and um, there is a table of contents to my disclosures and it identifies an exhibit number for reference. Excellent. Um, just as, and I believe some of my own um, statements are probably more germane to the permit issue as well. Um, so I will probably likely reserve those for that portion of today's hearing. Um, since I know that these proceedings are very purposefully focused um, and I appreciate that to the criteria for land, individual landmark designation. I think I'm gonna turn the virtual microphone over to a, a man who has much greater expertise on that particular subject um, than I do. Um, so with that, I will very humbly turn the microphone over to Mr. Kissel to walk through the applicant's presentation. Great. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Uh, thank you, uh, commissioners. Um, is it possible to uh, enable sharing of my screen? I will. Tech support. Kamal, are you, are you uh, enabling Yes, that? it's done now, yeah. Oh, right. okay, go ahead. I think, it, I think we also just as a matter of, we need to uh, present your name and. Uh, certainly, my name is George Kissel, uh, spelled K-I-S-I-E-L. Um, let me make sure I've got the right one here. Apologies for the delay there. Okay, for the record, uh, my name is George Kissel. I'm the president of Oakland Kissel Associates with offices at 122 South Michigan in Chicago. Um, as you know, I've submitted a report as well as a revised report into the record that covers my opinions on the subject property. So I'm 
just going to run through a presentation here that hits on a few points and also uh, includes a discussion of the criteria for landmark status. So we we note the subject property was built according to a permit that was issued in June of 1892 for the Schlitz Brewing Company. Um, and considering landmark status, context is important. Before we get to the subject property, I want to take a look at some examples of landmark tied houses. We're going to start with uh, Southport Lanes. So Southport Lanes was built in 1898 and is a prime example of a tied house rendered in the German Renaissance style. It displays a high level of distinctive detail, including the Schlitz globe. And in, in the case of tied houses, not only were the exteriors of these structures significant, so were the interiors. These were the equivalent of Schlitz franchises, not unlike a Burger King or a McDonald's. Schlitz fitted these out with bar, back bar, other furnishings, all with characteristics conveyed the fact that when you walked into one of these places that it was definitely a Schlitz joint. With respect to Southport Lanes, um, the interior retains many of those characteristics, including the back bar with characteristic mural showing a pastoral scene, tin ceilings, wood paneling, high quality finishes, as well as uh, in the bowling alley, um, a mural and uh, display of the Schlitz Globe logo. This was a later addition, and it's also likely that the mural um, was a replica based on the image over the bar. Uh, but it's clear that the interior, as well as the exterior of this building, say Schlitz. This is basically a, a poster child for a landmark tight house. The architectural style is rare and unique. You don't see a lot of German Renaissance examples in the city. It's richly detailed in stone and brick and metal and displays the Schlitz globe, immediately conveying its historic associations. The interior plan and furnishings, which is also a significant characteristic of tight houses, remains intact and also significantly contributes to the asset's ability to convey its historical associations. Clearly, this example has both associative value, that's to say it's linked to the brewing industry, saloons, and other aspects of Chicago's economic, historic, and social heritage, and construction value in the rare and unique German Renaissance style and the rich detailing of both the interior and exterior, including character the characteristic Schlitz globe. It retains a degree of integrity that's required for consideration as an individual Chicago landmark. Yet for reasons unknown, South Port Lanes is not designated as a Chicago landmark. So we're gonna move on now and take a look at the nine landmark Schlitz Tide Houses. They basically fall into three categories. There's a, a group of them that display the German Renaissance versions, which sort of represent the high-end samples of Tide House construction. There's the, what I'm gonna to refer to as the Plain Janes, which are less rich in their detailing and exemplify sort of the low end of the spectrum. And then finally, sort of the middle ground or the Queen Anne style examples of Tide Houses. Um, all of these landmark tied houses were built between 1897 and 1910. So the first representative of this uh, initial group is Shubas, um, located 3159 North Southport. Uh, again, you see the characteristic um, German Renaissance styling. Uh, the two colored brick pattern is uh, something that comes to define uh, one of the characteristics of the style. The interior uh, still functions as uh, a bar or a saloon, um, although the bar um, is likely not the original and it's possible the tin ceiling isn't the original, it still has the ability to convey its historic associations, both on the exterior and the interior. And the same holds true for the uh, performance area, which is uh, also restored in a similar fashion to what it would have been um, originally. The next example we're going to take a look at is Max Wood Grilled at 1801 West Division Street. Um, again, this is another example of the German Renaissance style. You see similar characteristics, including the characteristic Schlitz globe on the exterior of the building. It bears a very striking resemblance to Southport Lanes. The interior, uh, again, still furnished with a bar. Again, unclear whether it's original or not. However, it certainly retains its ability to convey its historic associations, both interior and exterior. So now we're going to look at uh, some tied house, some tied houses from this area that aren't landmarked. Uh, here's an example of 1870 South Blue Island. Uh, this is built for uh, by Schlitz um, 
under the uh, uh, Uline um, company. It displays uh, the same characteristics of uh, the German Renaissance architecture, the characteristic brick pattern, detailing and roof lines. Another structure at 2000 West Armitage displaying the Schlitz globe here, uh, significantly altered at the base, but displaying this sort of characteristic two color brick, um, uh, the buff and red brick with some stone detailing, uh, a little bit less elaborate in its styling, but similar to the um, German Renaissance uh, motifs in a similar situation here at 3024 North Car uh, California, Taqueria La Zaca Tacana. Um, again, similar brick pattern. All of these were uh, Schlitz tide houses that were confirmed by looking up the building permit records um, and uh, built during the same period of time between 1897 and 1910. So we're gonna take a look at the second group now, uh, which we're gonna refer to as the sort of Plain James, most recent landmarked uh, tide house here at 94, one South Ewing, formerly the Bamboo Lounge. Um, again, characteristic Schlitz globe on its elevation, uh, more plain detailing of the brick, uh, some stone details at the entrance and uh, metal detailing at the cornice and parapet. Uh, the interior of the bar um, when it was opened appeared to be close to original, if not original, similar with the tin ceiling. Again, uh, this has the ability to convey its historic associations, both of the exterior and the interior. Uh, moving on to the next, uh, 1400 South uh, Front Street. Uh, again, uh, a more plain rendition of the Tide House with the Schlitz Globe. Um, this one's vacant, the interior has been gutted. So while it, uh, its interior doesn't have the ability to convey its historic character and its historic associations, due to the presence of the globe on the outside, its exterior does maintain the ability to do that. We'll look at a few um, examples of these sort of plain Jane tied houses that are not landmarked. Uh, here's one at 2001 West Grand. Um, you see the parapet's been modified, but it maintains stone detailing. Uh, uh, more plain brick pattern is illustrated in the prior examples and the prominent Schlitz globe remains in this example. So this one's uh, attachment is uh, conveyed through the globe uh, logo embedded into the building. A couple more um, tied houses from this area, sort of more plainly rendered. This one's located 1400 West 69th, formerly uh, Joe's Food, pardon me, Joe's Foods. Uh, vacant, vacant at the ground floor at this point, um, without a Schlitz globe uh, or any other identifying feature, it's similar to uh, many of the, the store and flat buildings that you find scattered through Chicago's uh, commercial areas of Chicago's neighborhoods. Um, another example at uh, 105th and Corliss Avenue, this one's been converted to residential, uh, again a Schlitz tied house, uh, verified by building permit records. Um, Again, without any identifying feature, they're virtually indistinguishable from uh, other store and flat commercial structures. Move on to the final uh, group of landmark tide houses. These are more the Queen Anne style tide houses. This one's at uh, 1944 North Oakley, Floyd's Pub. Um, you see the, uh, the, the variation in the elevation characteristic of the uh, Queen Anne style. Prominent Schlitz globe, uh, bay windows and bay at the corner entrance. And again, on the interior, still maintains um, its integrity as a uh, drinking establishment. Its associations uh, with uh, Schlitz and Tide houses occur both on the interior and the exterior. Um, we're moving on to Floyd, or, I'm sorry, uh, 958 West 69th Street, which is the Car Caribbean Lounge still functioning as a, uh, um, again, a, a, a drinking establishment, Queen Anne style uh, globe prominently displayed at the corner entrance and elevation, uh, detailed bay windows, again, uh, able to convey its historic um, representations and associations, both from the interior and the exterior. Moving on to 2159 West Belmont, has been converted to a Starbucks. Um, again, Queen Anne styling, um, Schlitz globe uh, conveying its historic association while the in interior has been renovated and uh, no longer functions as a tavern or a bar. 
um, it's, the exterior uh, does maintain its ability to convey its historic associations. 5120 North Broadway, uh, Southeast Asian Center. Um, this one's a little bit of a cross between Queen Anne and German Renaissance, but we lumped it more in the Queen Anne style. Again, prominent Schlitz globe conveying on the exterior its association with uh, tight houses and the liquor industry, particularly the, the breweries. Uh, the interior has been renovated completely and uh, um, no longer maintains that degree of integrity. Uh, however, its exterior clearly uh, says Schlitz and says Tide House. And finally, we have the, I believe, the last um, landmarked uh, structure here at 3456 Southwestern Avenue, now a one stop market. Um, again, the Schlitz Globe, Queen Anne styling, uh, uh, clearly visible. Um, the Schlitz Globe is what conveys its uh, attachment and association with the brewing industry, Schlitz, and the uh, historic heritage that, uh, that has value to the city. Look at a couple other Queen Anne style uh, Schlitz tied houses that are not landmarked. This one at 3821 West Armitage, now a and Shoes. Another at 3759 West Fullerton, Donna Maria's. Um, again, Queen Anne styling, corner entrance, uh, you know, similar to many other um, Queen Anne style um, store and flat buildings that are scattered throughout. We did a quick um, sort of aerial photo Google Earth study of areas that were built up between uh, prior to 1900 and identified about 200 uh, Queen Anne style corner store and flat buildings. Only about a quarter of them uh, had saloons in them and even fewer of course were tied houses. So to, to sort of illustrate the point, I'm gonna take a look at a few non uh, tied house Queen Anne style uh, corner buildings. You'll see the similarity between these structures and tied house structures. Here's one at 1362 West Belmont, uh, prominent corner treatment, uh, you know, detailing of the cornice uh, Queen Anne style store and flat building. Uh, again, very common throughout the city of Chicago and its neighborhood commercial areas. Another at 3224 West North Air Avenue, very similar to the Tide House on Southwestern Avenue, Queen Anne styling corner entrance, uh, detailing on the elevations. And finally, uh, 53, um, 57 North Ashland, again, uh, Queen Anne styled non Schlitz Tide House building. Interestingly enough, this one was actually built by a gentleman by the name of Nicholas Schlitz. However, he had uh, no association with the Schlitz brewing family. Uh, what can be drawn from this exercise is really that there isn't a consistent style for Tide Houses in this area, um, with the possible exception of the German Renaissance style Tide Houses. Without the distinguishing characteristic Schlitz globe, these buildings are basically indistinguishable from the typical vernacular store and flat buildings of that time period. So after having a, a grasp on the context of the existing uh, landmarks, we're gonna move our discussion to the, the, to the subject property. Excuse me. So tight houses were constructed uh, pretty much between the early 1800s to 1910. Uh, this is a period of rapid change in terms of technology and uh, various other things. It was also an era of economic booms and busts. Um, turns out there was a pretty severe depression in the United States between 1893 and 1897. And tight house construction is kind of split between um, pre and post depression eras. The subject property falls into the pre-depression area being built in 1892. So in the 1870s and 80s, uh, there were technological advances in brewing and as well as overinvestment in facilities. And this led to an overproduction of beer. Brewers wanted to make beer as available as possible. So during this period, beer marketing was focused on selling beer directly. The location of outlets, which were primarily tight house saloons was crucial because most of the product was served directly from kegs. There, this was before bottling and canning involved. So local consumers chose their favorite saloon based on the quality and the price of the beer and the food offered the atmosphere of the locations and their own class, as well as their ethnicity. Brand loyalty was not well established at this time. Customers were attracted by cheap offers, free samples, free food, and a large number of giveaways, such as calendars, glassware, and signs. Prime busy intersections in denser areas of the city 
locations like Chicago and Armitage, Damon and North, uh, Damon and Division, near transit stops, and highly trafficked areas were the priority for the building of tide houses. These were the closely more built up and dense areas. The early area of tide house construction was focused on providing outlets in prime locations, utilizing the store and flat prototype, the more prominent locations displaying a greater level of design and detail in the less densely populated areas. More advances in technology stabilized the quality of beer. Competition also increased as a result. So now marketing and branding became more important. In the later area of tide house construction, they showed the same concerns for location. However, the branding and marketing of the Schlitz name became more important. And this of course is reflected in the widespread use of the Schlitz Globe trademark in architectural detailing of the later period tide houses from which all of the existing landmark structures have been drawn. So while the subject property, with the subject property built during the pre-depression era, so to speak, there are no indications in the architectural features of the building that this was a Schlitz tide house. It's a typical stored flat building rendered in a popular Queen Anne style at the time. So we'll see in the following slides, the subject property as well as other early area era tide houses are indistinguishable from other large vernacular stored flat buildings of the same era. Take a look at a couple of them. So uh, staff provided the example at 235 North Ashland. Um, there's another one at 2600 West, West North Avenue, which is also built by the Uline in 1891. Um, as you can see, it bears uh, a very strong resemblance, absent the Schlitz globe, to the other types of uh, Queen Anne's uh, style buildings, store and flat buildings that dominate, um, you know, the, the denser areas of the city and the closer in. Um, you know, so here we have a couple of examples at 2301 West North Avenue and 213, 219 West North Avenue. Um, property, so moving on, we know that the subject property is orange rated. Uh, I'm gonna take a look at some other Queen Anne style store and flats, sort of comparison for other orange rated buildings. Um, we're taking a look here at 1825 West Armitage and 2100 North Halstead. These are both orange rated buildings and they're part of landmark districts. They're not designated as individual landmarks. Uh, 825 West Armitage is part of the Armitage Historic District and 2100 North Hal Halstead, part of the Halstead Willow District. And a couple other examples of high quality uh, store and flat buildings of the larger variety at 925 West Armitage, as well as 435 West North Avenue. Um, so you know, basically, uh, again, the general takeaway here is that tight houses are indistinguishable from the typical vernacular Queen Anne style store and flat buildings that dominate the corners of the busier neighborhoods of commercial streets. So now we'll move on for a quick discussion of the criteria on landmarking before I close uh, my testimony and presentation. <clears throat> Excuse me. So staff indicates subject property meets three of the criteria for landmarking as well as the integrity criteria. Uh, the first criteria is that it's a critical part of the city's history. In other words, we're talking about its value as an example of the architectural, cultural, economic, <clears throat> historic, social, or other aspect of the city of Chicago's heritage, state of Illinois, United States. So uh, the history and significance of saloons and tight houses are well documented in literature and other scholarly works. And it's clear by the building permit records and real estate transaction data uh, from sources such as the economist, the American contractor, as well as the city's historic uh, permit records, the subject property was indeed built by Schlitz Brewing Company and as a Tide House. So it's clear that it has some value as an example of the cultural, economic, historic, and social heritage of the city of Chicago. With respect to important architecture, in other words, its exemplification is an architectural type or style distinguished by innovation, rarity, uniqueness, or overall quality of design, detail, and material and craftsmanship. It's important to note here that the subject property is being considered as an individual landmark. It's also important to note that subject property is basically vernacular architecture. It's a common building type rendered in the sort of style of the time, if you will. This is not the Monadnock building. It's not the Board of Trade. It's not the Chicago Theater or the Roby House. Um, that's not to say that vernacular architecture can't be considered 
as individual landmarks, but this is also not the Krauss Music Store. The example has to be distinguished by rarity or unique with uniqueness or overall quality of design detail materials or craftsmanship. When we look at the prior landmark examples, it's clear that the ones that are rendered in the German Renaissance style are certainly rare and unique. You don't see that everywhere. Queen Anne style store and flat buildings, however, are common and numerous in the city through its neighborhoods and commercial areas. They're not rare, nor are they unique. Less, of course, they're adorned with a Schlitz globe. That feature distinguishes them, even if stylistically the building is not particularly special. Here again, that's not the case. Its features, style, and detailing do not rise to the level of rarity or uniqueness and are based, and based on other examples, they're not distinguished by overall quality of design, detail, materials, craftsmanship, such that it rises to individual landmark status. Finally, we'll talk about criteria six, which is a distinctive theme. Pardon me. So the criteria states its representation of an architectural, cultural, economic, historic, social, or other theme expressed through distinctive areas, buildings, places, structures, works of art, or other objects that may or may not be contiguous. In the case of tide houses, the distinctive themes are both architectural, which imply historical significance through design or construction value, and economic, historic, and social, which imply significance through associative value, in other words, being associated with economic historic and social events. In order to satisfy this criteria, the subject property we need to visually be visually identifiable as a tide house in order to convey its association with historically significant economic, historic, or social events. Given the subject property displays no distinctive architectural detail or characteristics that identify it with any brewery, Schlitz in particular, it fails to meet this criteria. Finally, with respect to integrity, Based on the foregoing analysis, the subject property can only consider it as being associated with economic, historic, and social events as a tide house. And as the subject property is a no longer a tide house, and there are no surviving characteristics on the interior or the exterior that identify it as such, it fails to meet the integrity criteria for individual landmark status. So in closing, um, it's well understood that historic preservation is an important part of the vitality and character of cities, particularly here in the city of Chicago with its rich architectural heritage, but that can't be the only consideration. It's also important to consider broader planning initiatives that the city has undertaken in this context. In 2016, the city expanded the downtown into the areas that were viewed as underutilized and could sustain additional density. The subject probably sits in one of these expansion areas. The purpose was to capitalize on market forces and increase the real estate tax base by leveraging market, market trends. This is sound planning and public policy. All of the prior landmark tide houses are in neighborhood zoning districts with the current development closely matching what's allowed under zoning in terms of capacity. Basically, there's little if any zoning headroom and none of, the can, none of these are candidates for redevelopment. That's not the case with the subject property. Here in the expanded downtown district, there's potential for large increases in floor area ratio, providing incentives for redevelopment consistent with broader city policies. At the same time, the city instituted changes to its affordable housing ordinance, creating the near north and near west side pilot programs, in effect doubling the affordable housing requirements in some of these areas. Subject property falls within the pilot program area. These programs focused on leveraging development trends. Commissioner, I, I apologize for interrupting. Um, the department would just object to this portion of the testimony as not involving landmark designation criteria. I would Understood. agree. Understood. Should not I'll be close, part of the record. We'll, we'll close it up um, um, and move ahead. So, you know, we do understand that this commission has a narrow focus on preservation, and uh, we, we certainly note uh, uh, Councillor Wilson's objections. However, it's important that. Uh, and it is important that uh, the voice of preservation be heard and considered. However, in this case, where the subject property is a marginal structure at best, being considered for individual landmark status, the hope is that eventually the broader policies come under consideration. So this concludes my presentation and testimony. I'll turn it back to council at this point. Thank you for your presentation. Um, does uh, the commission staff have any questions regarding the presentation? Um, hearing none, 
Um, now, uh, Commissioner, I, I apologize. Yes. I just, uh, DPD will have questions. I just have a procedural um, question. I, I know cross-examination of experts is usually more appropriate at the permit portion of the hearing. Um, I'm just not sure whether uh, Mr. Kissel will be testifying again at that portion. I, I'm happy to question him now if that's just the plan to incorporate it at the second portion or um, wait until the permit uh, portion of the hearing if he's going to take uh, the virtual stand again. I may, uh, counsel. I don't believe Mr. Kissel will be testifying for the permit portion of the hearing, so I'm I'm happy to have you do your cross examination at this at this juncture. Um, with that in mind, Mr. Hearing Officer, I was also wondering procedurally, is there going to be a determination made on each of the two issues after the pertinent portions of the hearing um, so that there'll be a decision rendered on with regard to the landmark designation after this first testimony and then separately after the permit portion of the um, hearing or is everything going to be based on the whole <laughs> hearing because I do have a statement that I want to make but I just want to make sure I get it in at the right point. Um, I don't believe we're making any uh, determinations uh, today. Okay. Right? So um... Uh, that works. I can just <laughs> Save it for the second part of okay. the hearing okay. then as long as Great. it's in today's record. Okay. Thank you. I Great. apologize for my um, oh, naivety. Right. <laughs> um, and with that, Mr. Wilson or Council Wilson, if you would like to cross examine Mr. Kreisel. Thank you, Ms. That, that's helpful. And um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, Commissioner, I just have a couple questions if that's okay. Yes, please. Okay. Um, Mr. Kissel, my name is Brad Wilson. I work for the city's law department um, and I'm representing the Department of Planning and Development here. How are you? Good, how are you doing? I'm good. Um, I just have a few questions about the content of uh, your report and your testimony today. Um, the first is um, your report and your testimony concluded that 1399 Westlake was in fact operated as a tide house uh, associated with Schlitz, correct? That is correct, yes. And uh, it, you also concluded that it operated from approximately 1893 through approximately uh, the mid 1910s. Is that correct? Mid to late? Yeah, I don't think I made a determination on its period. Uh, however, it, it's very clear from the historical records that it was built as a tide house. Do you have any reason to uh, not believe that it was that it was operated through at least the mid 1910s? No, I have no reason to not believe that. In order uh, for a tide house to qualify for landmark status, is it your opinion that there must be brewery branding visible on the on the uh, exterior? There must be something that conveys its association with the brewery industry. In my opinion, simply being rendered in the Queen, Queen Anne style does not pass that bar. There needs to be something that identifies it with the brewing industry. And in this case, and actually in the context of all of the other uh, tide houses that have been landmarked. The Schlitz Globe is the vehicle for that when there's no other uh, uh, sort of portion of the uh, building or architecture that does that. So um, I, I guess long-winded way, yes. Um, the, the Schlitz Globe in this case is necessary in order for it to be able to convey um, that particular association. Thank you. Um, in preparing your report um, and your testimony today, um, did you undertake uh, historical research? Yes. And uh, what kind of documents did you review for that historical research? Um, they're, they're deep in many. So first of all, there's uh, books and literature. Uh, there's a great book titled The Saloon, which covers um, the, the brewing industry and uh, saloons in Chicago and Boston, uh, authored by a, a professor at University of Illinois, Chicago. A few other uh, well-known volumes that don't come to mind right now. Um, but th these sort of provide the background and the sort of the history of tide houses and their importance. And it's also, uh, you know, I, I reviewed all of the uh, prior documents by the Department of Planning and, and uh, Historic Preservation on the prior tide house, and they do a very good job of, uh, you know, illuminating that fact. Um, as far as the individual properties and the records, uh, there's uh, several uh, um, uh, online sources that we use for that. So in order to determine 
uh, you know, what's a tide house, uh, probably the easiest place to look, at least for the ones between 18, uh, I guess, 97 and 2010 is the, uh, I think the national contractors um, journal uh, that has a searchable uh, database that will allow you to look for uh, the significant characters such as Uline, Schlitz, um, and, and various other, uh, you know, you also check misspellings of Uline and misspellings of Schlitz, and sometimes you find uh, these kinds of things. You know, these are, these are digitized records, so you got to take them a little bit with a grain of salt. Uh, the Chicago, uh, the online building permit index, the historic building permit index is another source. Um, again, that one's a little bit tough. You got to be able to read cursive writing, and that's uh, not, a, not a skill that's uh, uh, present. And in, in fact, the style of cursive writing at that point in time is different than when I learned it. So, um, you know, there's, a, there's some interpretation needs to be done there, but they, nonetheless, those provide uh, uh, pr pretty much a, an, an excellent resource for that. Uh, of course, we use aerial, aerial photography. We have an inventory of Sanborn maps. Uh, the Robinson map of the city is available, Rasher maps. These sort of confirm uh, the Sanborn maps tracked uh, saloons because they were a greater fire risk. And of course, Sanborn fire insurance maps are uh, uh, basically a, a fire insurance uh, tool. So, they, they do a pretty good job of determining what's a saloon and what's not. So that provides you some clues for some things to research. Um, you know, of course, uh, aerial photography. Um, you know, uh, my, my firm has a, uh, a long history of documenting the cities uh, uh, from the air since 1986. So we have a very good uh, sort of set of resources for that, along with, of course, Google Earth, Google Street View. And there are other journals and uh, uh, various um, sources that we use. The Economist uh, published the, a lot of land sale data. And uh, I think there's the Building and Real Estate Journal also uh, does a good job of that. So there's a pretty broad sense, a broad range of things that we use to determine uh, you know, what was a tide house and what wasn't and sure. where they are in the city. Um, so that's, yeah, pretty substantial historical research. Does the landmark designation process often involve um, that type of historical research? Yes, it does. Okay, um, I want to ask you about a couple of uh, sentences in your report. Um, in describing the Southport Lanes building, which uh, was, I, I think you uh, testified on today, um, you stated that it is, this is a quote, is located at the corner of two well-traveled streets, has a corner entrance and characteristic corner bay or turret. Do you recall that? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, you go on to say that these features uh, establish the exterior of the building, clearly conveying the historic aspect of Schlitz Tide Houses. Um, and today, I think you called the Southport Lanes a uh, poster child for Tide Houses. Is that right? Correct. Uh, one thing to note, though, it's really uh, the, the, the style, the, the, the distinctive German Renaissance style of architecture that really distinguishes it. not as much the Queen Anne style things, because as we've shown in, in the testimony also through the report, there are a lot of examples of that that are not tied houses. So it's your opinion, though, that these exterior elements um, can convey the existence of a Schlitz tied house? Well, that if we limit the, uh, I, I would say it's really only the German Renaissance that does that absent the Schlitz globe. If it's just a straight up Queen Anne style building, that does not convey that it's uh, a Schlitz tied house. Because as we've shown, that's a common that was a common style during the period when tide houses were constructed. Understood. Um, relatedly, uh, there's no dispute here that this building does exhibit the Queen Anne architectural style, correct? Well, uh, I would say it's more the uh, German uh, Renaissance style. I, I'm sorry, I, I mean the, the subject property. Okay, the subject property, yes, Queen Anne style. Um, and just last question, or uh, your report, um, and your testimony today regarding the Queen Anne style, you concluded that the, the subject property, quote, does not compare, um, end quote, with other examples of the Queen Anne style in other areas of the city. Is that right? Other finer examples, yes. And uh, you specifically cited the Armitage Halstead district, is that right? Yes. And um, you included in your report and in your testimony today, um, 825 West Armitage Avenue as an example of a high quality Queen Anne style building in that district, correct? Correct. Okay, uh, thank you for your time. I don't have any other questions. Certainly. Thank you. Um, yeah. Would I be allowed to redirect, ask a couple of redirect questions from Mr. Kissel? I would, I think so. Um, 
Mr. I want to confer with counsel very quick. Is that that's okay, correct, Mr. Gaynor? Yes, I, I, I in your discretion to allow that, sure. Okay, sure, I allow it. I'll keep it brief. I appreciate you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Kissel, going back to your research and preparing your findings and report, is it true that you um, in your research found approximately 200 um, examples of this same similar finer Queen Anne's style architecture um, throughout the city? Um, I wouldn't say they're necessarily finer, but they're certainly the examples of, of Queen Anne style, yes. From, Some that, other, yeah. from that same um, era, period of time, is that correct? That is correct. And of those 200 other Queen Anne style buildings, um, approximately 40 of those buildings had taverns or once operated as a tavern or tide house. Is that also true? That's correct. Based on uh, Sanborn map data, yes. Okay, so the fact that a building built in the late 1890s and early 1900s um, operate, had Queen Anne's architecture was um, and acknowledged some of the architectural features such as the bay windows, the corner turrets, that alone does not necessarily convey um, that it was a, a, a landmarked or a significant tide house. Is that true? That's true, yes. And in particular, a Schlitz Brewery tide house? That is correct. Um, and towards that end, were the corner turrets that are identifiable in the subject property and several of the others, including the South Port lanes, um, as well as the bay windows, were those common architectural features found during this era with regard to the Queen Anne's, the store and flat buildings? Yes. So again, those aren't unique or rare to these tight houses. No, they're not. Those features. Um, and lastly, or I guess two questions, but kind of combined, <laughs> um, again, just to reiterate and affirm all of the nine, 10 landmarked um, tide houses that have been landmarked to date do feature the Schlitz Globe. Is that correct? In some That's capacity? true. The, the nine tide houses in the one stable building, yes. Thank you. And um, that's also true as we saw with Southport Lanes. Is that also that is correct? correct? Yes. Which such building has not been landmarked. Is that right? That is correct. Um, thank you. I have no further questions for Mr. Kissel. Thank you, Ms. Barnes. Um, I have one question for Mr. Kissel. Um, were, in your research, were there um, other examples of Queen Anne Schlitz Tide houses that did not bear the, the globe logo? Uh, yeah, several of them were shown in the, uh, in the slide presentation. Um, okay. Their addresses escape me right now. Yep, no, I just wanted to confirm that. And did you mention anything about the, the ghost logo that um, appears on this building? Uh, the, the painted sign? No. Okay. I, I don't have any further questions. Um, thank you very much. Um, I think uh, we'll now hear from, um, now we'll hear uh, statements from members of the general public regarding the proposed landmark designation. Statements may be made in favor of or in opposition to the proposed landmark designation Per the emergency rules, anyone wishing to make a statement regarding the proposed designation must have submitted their appearance form via email no later than 48 hours prior to the commence, uh, commencement of the public hearing. Uh, statements from members of the general public are limited to three minutes. Please state your name and address and the person or organization you represent, if applicable, in the interest of time, you are encouraged to focus your statements on, inf on information not previously given. Um, the commission also accepts written comment on the subject of the public hearing from members of the public up to 24 hours prior to the scheduled commencement of the public hearing. Any written comments received have been posted on the commission's website and will be deemed incorporated into the record. Uh, first, you will hear statements from members of the general public in favor of the proposed landmark designation. Um, we have received two appearance forms, both in favor of the designation. First. Can we please hear from Ward Miller? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, um, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Ward Miller. I'm Executive Director of Preservation Chicago. We at Preservation Chicago fully support the Chicago landmark designation 
of the former Schlitzbury Tide House, located at 1393 to 1399 West Lake Street on Chicago's near west side. We also want to encourage you, Mr. Vice Chairman, and the city of Chicago to deny the permit application for the demolition of the building known as the former Schlitzbury Tide House. The Schlitzbury Tide House um, at the southeast corner of Lake and Loomis streets and near Ogden Avenue is a fine quality building of great craftsmanship and design and constructed in anticipation of the Chicago World's Fair of 1893 where the belted globe design was unveiled um, and displayed in a very big way, which was also a, a visible and painted asset and ghost sign and logo um, painted on the east side of the building. The Schlitz Tide House over its overall composition quality of, de of detailing are outstanding. And this structure is an exemplary example of a Schlitz Tide House. Uh, the Schlitzbury and Tide House building uh, is also a highly visible uh, structure, lovely in appearance and seen for many blocks as one proceeds northward on Ogden Avenue to Lake Street. Its magnificent use of rich materials of red brick limestone, ornamental copper bays and corner turret make it a much admired building and part of the Ogden Avenue Lake Street near West Side built environment and view, and view shed. It's a very unique building and highly visible building in so many ways. Uh, the Schlitzbury Tide House was surveyed as part of the near West Side community area in 1984, determined at that time 37 years ago to be orange rated and published 25 years ago by the city of Chicago in the Chicago Historic Resources document. So this has been um, really well known for many years. We at Preservation Chicago were proud to assist um, in the historical research as well as gathering public signatures over 8,217 petition signatures spanning 375 pages with 25 pages of public comments, all in favor of preservation of this building and a landmark designation. And that is coming from the citizens of the city of Chicago. So we together, these 400 pages really support the, the department and its uh, landmark designation of this extremely important historic Schlitz Tide House. And we are grateful for this opportunity to speak in support of this Chicago landmark designation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Now, can we please hear from Diane Gonzalez? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Diane Gonzalez, a resident and preservationist in the Old Town Triangle District and a member of Preservation Chicago's board. This handsome 1892 storefront with flats above is a treasure in the Fulton Market District. We were pleased that it was granted preliminary landmark status last month. In Candolin's presentation today, you heard about its characteristics and origin as a Schlitz, Schlitz Tide House and its landmark criteria met. We know the landmark Fulton District itself is one of Chicago's fastest changing neighborhoods. New hotels, tech centers, and trendy restaurants have arrived in the area that in the 1880s was home to many warehouses for food wholesalers. In the midst of the newcomers since the venerable 1393 West Lake Building, now is the chance to save this historically and architecturally important storefront. It inadvertently, the structure had been granted a demo permit, which was rescinded and preliminary designation was unanimously granted in April. With the subsequent publicity, it is amazing how many Chicagoans recognize this building fondly, saying they recall it from driving down Lake Street or Ogden Avenue or eating at La Luce. It has handsome turrets, beautiful bays, and distinctive copper trim. For some Chicagoans, this building and the L running overhead, what they knew about this part of Lake Street. On a personal note, my great-grandfather, Antonio Gonzalez, a Spanish immigrant cigar maker, resided on the near west side from 1887 to 1893. Great grandpa frequented taverns. I like to imagine he visited the newly built Tide House where he imbibed in his Schlitz. For Antonio and the innumerable others who've enjoyed 1393 West Lake, either dining or drinking inside or from passing by on the outside, 1393 Lake deserves designation. It has been granted preliminary landmark status. Let's not go backwards. Please oppose its demolition and grant it permanent landmark status. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ms. Gonzalez. Uh, we, ha we have not received any requests to speak against the designation. So this concludes the public comment portion regarding designations. Um, this, and, and this concludes the, the landmark designation portion of today's public hearing. Um, the commission will consider the entire record, including the transcript of today's hearing at the June 3rd, 2021 regular meeting of the Commission on Chicago Landmarks to be held remotely and determine whether to make a final recommendation to city council on the proposed landmark designation of the former Schlitz Brewery Tide House building at 1393 to 1399 West Lake Street. This meeting is open to the public and details for participation and listening to a simulcast are available on the commission so website at chicago.gov slash ccl. Um, I think we could take a five minute uh, break um, and can reconvene at 1135. So we'll put this on pause and um, we'll, we'll come back at, uh, and, and begin at 1135.
Okay, um, it's now 11.35. Um, I'd like to call this meeting back to order and proceed with part two um, um, for the permit hearing. Um, my name is Gabriel Jakiewicz and I'm a member of the Commission in Chicago Landmarks and I'm the hearing officer for this, uh, today's public hearing. Um, Michael Gaynor, the Commission's legal counsel is also present for today's public hearing. As I stated at the beginning of the hearing, in part one, the purpose of today's hearing is twofold. Um, first, our first purpose was to receive testimony and statements relative to the commission's consideration of designation for the proposed former Slitz Brewery Tide House at 1393 to 1399 West Lake. We have just concluded that portion of the hearing. And the second purpose of today's hearing is to, is to gather testimony and evidence to determine whether the proposed demolition of the building is contrary to the criteria of Article 3, Section G, 3A of the rules and regulations and per section G3B and is a per se adverse effect on the significant historical and architectural features. Only testimony and evidence that is relevant to those determinations as set forth in Article 3, sections G3 and G4 of the Commission's rules and regulations will be allowed. First, I will hear and rule on all requests for party status and then take appearances uh, of the parties and their counsel. Those wishing to request party status were required to file an appearance form no later than 10 days prior to today's public hearing. Uh, any non-party interested in making a statement was to required to file an appearance form no later than 48 hours prior um, to today's hearing. I have received two appearance forms from parties as a matter of right, uh, one from the applicant in favor of the permit application and one from the city's Department of Planning and Development in opposition to the permit application. In accordance with the commission's rules and regulations, I hereby grant status, uh, party status to both. Um, would the applicant and the applicant's attorney please identify themselves? Good afternoon once more, Commissioner. Um, for the record, my name is Sarah Barnes and I am an attorney with the Law Offices of Sam Banks, um, located at 221 North LaSalle Street. I am counsel of record um, on behalf of Veritas LLC, the applicant and property owner for these proceedings. We do have with us here today as well, virtually, um, Mr. Stephen DeGraff, who is a managing member and co-owner of um, the applicant. Mr. DeGraff, if you can just state your name for the record. Stephen DeGraff, for the record. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, would the representative of the Department of Planning and Development and its attorney please identify themselves? Yes, Commissioner. Uh, for the department, it's uh, Bradley Wilson from the city's law department for the Department of Planning and uh, Development. Hello, Commissioner. Uh, and this is Diana Covallo, Architect 4 with the Historic Preservation Division of the Department of Planning and Development. Thank you. In addition to parties as a matter of right, the Landmarks Ordinance allows individuals or organizations to become parties by request if the person or, or organization's use or enjoyment of a landmark or landmarks district may be injured by the approval or disapproval of the permit application. And two, if the person or organization owns, leases, or resides in a property located within 500 feet of the boundary line of the landmark or landmark district. Um, I've not received any appearance forms from persons uh, seeking to become a party by request. So next um, we will hear from Mr. Gaynor who will outline the chronology of events relating to this permit application uh, that have led to this public hearing and incorporate the commission's exhibits into the record. Mr. Gaynor. Thank you, Commissioner. Again, Michael Gaynor from the city's law department representing the uh, Commission uh, and hearing officer today. On December 2nd, 2020, Commission on Chicago Landmark staff received a wrecking permit application number 100-901-1650 for the former Schlitz Brewery Tide House at 1393 to 1399 West Lake Street, the building. A copy of the wrecking permit application is identified as Commission Exhibit 1. Per Municipal Code Section 14A-4-407.6, 
through 14A-4-407.7, the 90-day demolition delay process was triggered and a copy of the notice sent to the owner dated December 2nd, 2020 is included as Commission Exhibit 2. A letter sent from the applicant's attorney dated January 22nd, 2021, requesting a 30-day extension of the demolition delay through March 30th, 2021, as well as the commission's letter dated January 26th, 2021, approving the request, are included as a Commission Exhibit 3. A letter sent from the applicant's attorney dated February 22nd, 2021, requesting a second 30-day extension of the demolition delay through April 30th, 2021, as well as the commission's letter dated February 22nd, 2021, approving that request, are identified as Commission Exhibit 4. Commission staff's courtesy letter dated March 11, 2021 is included as Commission Exhibit 5. This letter was mailed to the applicant and emailed to the applicant and his team notifying them that preliminary landmark designation and the permit application for demolition would be included in the April 1, 2021 Commission on Chicago Landmarks meeting agenda and the consequent requirement per sections 2-120-820 of the Municipal Code for expedited consideration of the designation and permit should the Commission vote to approve the designation and deny the permit application. The proposed preliminary designation and permit application for demolition were placed on the April 1, 2021 agenda of the regular monthly meeting of the Commission on Chicago Landmarks. The staff presentation for the designation is included as Commission Exhibit 6. The recommendation for preliminary designation of the building is identified as Commission Exhibit 7. The preliminary summary of information dated April 2021, included as part of the recommendation, is identified as Commission Exhibit 8. Public comments received regarding the proposed designation and demolition are identified as Commission Exhibit 9. The staff report and presentation for the permit application for demolition are included as Commission Exhibit 10. On April 1, 2021, the Commission voted to approve the preliminary designation of the building. They subsequently voted to preliminary dis preliminarily disapprove the permit application for demolition based on the Commission's findings that A, the significant historical or architectural features of the building are all exterior elevations, including roof lines, excluding the non-historic one-story frame structure with fabric roof and vestibule at the building rear, and B, the demolition of the building, a proposed landmark, is contrary to the criteria of Article 3, Section G3A of the Rules and Regulations, and per Section G3B, is a per se adverse effect on the significant historical and architectural features of the property. A letter dated April 12, 2021, was sent via certified mail to the applicant and emailed to the applicant and his team. The letter notified the applicant of the preliminary designation, preliminary decision on the demolition, and the scheduling of a public hearing on May 12, 2021, along with proof the letter was sent via certified mail with return receipt requested, are identified as Commission Exhibit 11. Notice of the hearing was posted at two locations outside the building, and an affidavit and dated photographs from Emily Barton of the Commission on Chicago Landmark staff confirming that the sign was installed at 1393 to 1399 West Lake Street on April 25, 2021, are identified as Commission Exhibit 12. A legal notice for the public hearing was published in the Chicago Sun-Times on April 20th, 2021, and the certificate of publication from the Sun-Times attesting thereto is identified as Commission Exhibit 13. The public hearing notice was also posted on the Department of Planning and Development's website, and a printout is included as Commission Exhibit 14. I'd like to incorporate these documents of the Commission into the record. The Commission's documents are available for inspection via email request. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gainer. Um, let those uh, documents be incorporated into the record. Um, we will now hear uh, opening statements from the parties. Please note this is an opportunity to briefly summarize your position. You will have an opportunity to present your full case following opening statements. Does the attorney for the applicant wish to make an opening statement? Ms. Barnes, you're on mute. Sorry, I got booted off of this. Had to re-log in. Um, my apologies. I do. Um, I just have a brief opening statement. Um, just again, as a matter of relevant procedural history, um, if I may. Um, 
back as acknowledged in the record um, the, from the April 1st Commission Landmarks Commission hearing, um, staff acknowledged receiving a, demoli a permit for demolition, an application for demolition permit in April, in and around April of 2016. Although the records do not show issuance of a demo permit as a result of that application, it was acknowledged by staff that they received it and that no action was taken um, towards landmarking or otherwise in instituting other preservation efforts for this building. And that permit application, as far as the records show, was never actively denied. And that was um, after staff um, with the preserva Historic Preservation Division had that permit application for at least 90 days, um, three months. So after a total of 90 days, there was no action or efforts made by um, the historic preservation staff to landmark the building or to otherwise deny the demolition permit. Um, and the reason I just feel that that's relevant here too is um, nothing has really changed about that building um, since then, it was five years ago. And um, yet now we are the subject of a possible landmark designation as well as denial of a, a similar demolition permit application um, on what seems to be a very arbitrary um, basis. So I just wanted to get that into the record from a procedural basis because um, all of this is coming as quite a surprise to the current property owners. Um, which I know is not exactly germane to these proceedings, but I think the history of the permit application and the lack of um, efforts is. So with that, um, I conclude my opening statement. That's kind of our position and we respectfully request that the pending demolition permit be um, issued accordingly. Thank you. Um, and does the uh, attorney for the Department of Planning and Development wish to make an opening statement? Uh, yes, please, Commissioner. Again, it's Brad Wilson with the city's law department for DPD. Um, just briefly, the permit review portion of this public hearing is to evaluate the application to demolish the building at 1393 through 99 West Lake Street. Um, the department has submitted evidence, including numerous photographs, previous Tide House designation reports, um, an expert report, and the position statement um, of DPD. Um, that, that we submitted with our disclosures. So that evidence, along with the testimony of the department's expert today, Matthew Wickland, will show that approving the permit would have an adverse effect on the significant historical and architectural features of the building. Um, under Article 3, Rule G1 of the Commission's rules, the significant historical and architectural features are those that qualify it for landmark designation. So there will be some overlap between the DPD presentation and Mr. Wickland's testimony today. But taken all together, uh, the department believes that the evidence clearly shows that the building and its features qualify as significant historical and architectural features under the commission's rules and demolishing it would destroy those features and lead to a per se adverse um, uh, effect. We don't intend to provide testimony based on any prior issuance of any permits. Those aren't before the commission today and we don't believe that they are relevant to this proceeding. The whether or not the commission caught it in 25 years ago does, is not relevant to where we are now because the commission has caught it this time and instigated these proceedings. So that'll be the evidence we're presenting today and at the conclusion of uh, our evidence we'll be asking that the commission deny the permit application. Thank you. Um, we'll now hear from uh, each party's case. Uh, first, we'll hear from the applicant, second from DPD. Each party will have an opportunity to present evidence and testimony for or against their permit application, and each party will have the opportunity to cross-examine witnesses. The rules and regulations permit redirect and recross, and also permit the applicant to present rebuttal evidence and, and testimony. As a hearing officer, I may also question uh, witnesses. <clears throat> After the parties are finished presenting their cases, we'll take statements from the public. Please describe any evidence that you have submitted to the hearing officer as, uh, as it was received prior to the hearing. Um, the applicant uh, may now present its case. Thank you once more, um, Commissioner. With 
Mr. Kissel, are you still on? Yes, I'm still here. Um, similar to uh, Council Wilson, um, Commissioner, we are our sentiments are much reiterated um, or the same as they were for the landmark designation portion of the hearing because some of the features do overlap. So with that, I'm just gonna ask Mr. Kissel a couple of follow-up um, questions towards that same end. Um, Mr. Kissel? Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Gaynor, do we need to have um, Mr. Kissel uh, sworn in oh. or is that done already? Yeah, I don't believe I was sworn. It can be a retroactive swearing in. <laughs> Council Gaynor, you're muted, I think. I'm sorry, I misunderstood the question. Yes, if uh, if Mr. Kissel is going to testify now, we should swear him in. So, uh, Mr. Kissel, do you swear to tell the truth and hold whole truth? I do. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, you may proceed, uh, Ms. Barnes. Your sound is a little muffled. Um, Mr. Kissel, during the staff's testimony with regard to the landmark designation and in particular criteria number four, um, which went towards um, the exemplary architectural features of the building, um, some of those features that were pointed out as significant as significant to staff um, towards their evaluation was the bay window and the corner turret. Again, in your, your presentation, you acknowledged that those are pretty common features on many of the Queensland style architecture buildings from that era. Is that correct? Uh, yes, they are. Do you find those to be um, rare or unique or even raised to the level of historically significant? Uh, no, I do not. Uh, inter uh, important thing to note in the examples that we showed of uh, the orange rating rated buildings, none of those were designated as individual landmarks. They did qualify as contributing structures to districts. However, not a single one of those examples um, that were shown are individual landmarks uh, according to the, the criteria for landmarking in the city of Chicago. Thank you. Um, and even assuming in arguendo that these features have some sort of historic relevance for that time, not rising to the level of rare or unique for landmark designation, but with regard to um, this second part of the hearing, which is related to the issuance of a permit for demolition. Uh, you've had over 25 years of experience with um, historic preservation in and throughout Chicago, is that right? Uh, yes. And you've worked on hundreds or maybe a hundred or so um, preservation type projects, is that right? Well, no, not really. Uh, uh, we, we've been active for over 40 years in the city of Chicago. Um, we do have a, a portfolio of preservation assignments. However, uh, you know, most of our work uh, has to do with the city's uh, context, uh, history, and things such as that. As far as the actual preservation, um, we do have some experience in that. However, uh, you know, it's, it's not um, our sort of number one uh, uh, source of work, so to speak. Uh, but you are a licensed architect, is that I'm a, right? Yes, I am. And As you well have a, a, a certified planner. Planet. Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so towards that end, do you th do you believe that it is possible to preserve and otherwise readapt some of the features of this building um, into a new or a new development um, in some sort of fashion? Um, of course. Okay, and that's if even the bulk of the building were to be demolished. Uh, it's certainly bay windows and uh, uh, corner turrets could be a part of, um, you know, any development. 
And that's your opinion as, again, a licensed architect? Yes. Thank you. Um, so then is it your opinion that the issuance of a demolition permit for um, the subject property will have an adverse impact on the significant historic features of this property? Uh, no. Thank you so much, Mr. Kissel. Um, I have no further questions or testimony at this time, Commissioner. Thank you. Uh, does uh, the city's attorney wish uh, to cross-examine the witness? Um, I just a, a couple, I think. Mr. Kissel, I assume that none of uh, your questions or your answers to my questions would have changed had you now that you're under oath? No, they would not have. Okay. I, I do have a question about um, this uh, distinguishing between landmark buildings on the one hand and buildings within a district on the other. Um, buildings that are found to be contributing within a district uh, still have to show um, that they have not been altered in a manner contrary to the features of that district. Is that correct? Uh, I'm not quite sure that that's the case. There are plenty of orange rated buildings that have been significantly altered that are uh, noted as uh, contributing uh, buildings to historic districts. Um, do you know if the landmark rules uh, require that um, a finding that the subject property has, if it's been altered, that it's a reversible change? Um, I don't know that that's uh, listed in the criteria. I know that's something that's talked about quite a bit okay. um, in preservation. Thank you. I don't have any other questions. Thank you. Uh, does the applicant's uh, attorney wish to uh, redirect? question. Mr. Kissel, do you, um, in your evaluation of the subject property, you did an interior and an exterior um, visit uh, inspection. Is that right? Yes, that's true. And is it your opinion that both the interior, the interior in particular, but as well, the exterior has been al altered significantly since its original construction? Uh, yes, it has. And that has affected the, as you stated in your report, as well as your direct testimony earlier, um, that has compromised the, the integrity of the um, building as a tight house. Is that right? Yes. Thank you. I have no Thank further you. questions. Thank you. Um, and uh, does the city's attorney wish to recross at all? No recross. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think I can ask a question. Um, I'm curious. Uh, so, uh, you know, so there was a somebody said. I think Ms. Barnes said that um, there. In, in your report, you're saying other Queen Anne buildings um, are not landmarks, but they're they're orange rated. And doesn't that doesn't that mean, Mr. Kissel? Doesn't that mean that they could be landmarked in the future? Um, well, I'm, I'm sure the commission is at liberty to landmark whatever they uh, see fit, um, given that uh, an application is put forward. But it, it's clear that uh, many landmark districts are landmarked because there's a desire to save some of these structures, even if they do not rise to the level of individual landmark status. It, it's, it's important to note that there's a, a, a difference and a higher bar for an individual landmark than there is for a contributing structure to a district. Um, you know, districts uh, convey uh, sort of a different uh, aspect of history. It has to do with streetscape. It has to do with um, you know, the era of architecture and the area of construction, it's um, sort of a broader sort of category of, of landmarks. And we see it used more increasingly um, uh, as time goes by. But the individual landmark status really is a higher bar to clear. If you look at the, the standards and the guidance that the, uh, the National Park Service talks about with respect to, uh, you know, individual landmark status, it, it clearly states that the level of integrity includes not only the exterior of the building, but if the interior of the building is a portion of what's significant historically, and in terms of tight houses, that's definitely the case, um, you know, that the integrity has to carry through both the interior and the exterior. Is the, um, is the orange rating kind of a, a vehicle to kind of reevaluate the building's integrity? Um, I, I don't believe so. So, you know, when the uh, when structures were evaluated in the historic resources survey, there was orange and there were also red category buildings. Those red category buildings were the ones that had the higher level of significance. And many of those red 
um, rated buildings have been, uh, you know, designated as landmarks. Now there are some orange buildings that have also been designated as landmarks. However, that individual landmarks, but that's much more rare than, uh, you know, the, uh, the situation where red buildings, um, have been designated as landmarks. I mean, ones that come to mind, uh, you know, uh, listed was the Krauss uh, music store, which is an orange rated building. Clearly, um, when you looked at that in greater detail, you saw this as Louis Sullivan and as one of his last work. So, you know, there are other things that contribute to um, individual landmark status. And it, it, it's, it, you know, historically has been a higher bar. Thank you. Does anyone have any other questions? All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Kissel. Um, the city uh, may now present its case. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. I just have some initial housekeeping matters as well. Um, the first is that the department, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little feedback from someone. Um, the department submitted uh, its disclosures 10 days before the hearing as required under the rules, and then again to the commission in an electronic binder with a table of contents and uh, exhibit numbers. We would just ask that those be included in the record of the hearing today. Okay, let those be included into the record. Um, the second housekeeping matter is just to point out again that there will be some overlap here because identifying the significant historical and architectural features involves interplay with the criteria under the landmark code. So I'll try to move as quickly through those as I can um, without belaboring the point. Um, but the city would ask uh, that we call uh, Mr. Wickland to the virtual stand. Okay, and um, let uh, Mr. Wickland be uh, sworn in. Uh, Mr. Reckland, do you swear to tell the truth? I do. Thank you. And if I could be, um, I've got the PowerPoint here, if I could be given presenter rights. Uh, you have it. Oh, thank you. I see it. Yep. Um, just one moment, please bear with me. All right. Um, Mr. Wickland, how are you? I'm doing well this afternoon. This Great. Uh, before we start, uh, could you just walk us through uh, your educational and career background? Certainly. So I'm, I have a master's degree in city planning and a master's degree in historic preservation. And I am currently an independent consultant working in the field of historic preservation and city planning. I work for individuals, landmark organizations, municipalities, non-for-profits and organizations and companies in the area of research for historic properties and other needs in historic preservation. Great, and have you um, had the experience of testifying in a proceeding like this before? Yes, I have. And what was that experience? That experience was with the near North District, which I was last year. Understood. Um, Excuse me, this is the court reporter, I'm having Trouble hearing Mr. Wickland. He has, um, it's either not a good connection, it's like he's underwater. I don't know if anything can be done about that. Thank you. Do you want to um, maybe try again a little closer to the mic, Mr. Wickland, to see if we have it? <clears throat> Certainly. Is, is this any better? Yes, I think it's a little better. All right. Um, uh, Mr. Wickland, could you, I don't want to overlap too extensively with what uh, the DPD staff went through, but could you just give us a general description of the, um, the area the building is situated in in the city? This particular building is located on the near west side of the city along the cor commercial corridor along Lake Street and of course near Ogden Avenue, which was built after the building was constructed. And it's in a largely industrial area but historically was a largely residential area. And the building's construction in the 1890s was of course part of its existence in the transformation of the area from residential to largely industrial. Understood. And is this an accurate representation on the screen of where the building is located? Yes, it is just north of Union Square. Great. And um, can you tell us a little about the history of this building realizing that we've been through some of it already? Of course. So initially, the property was sold to Mr. Uline 
in March of 1891. Later on, he ex received a building permit to construct the extant building in 1892. And it was part of Uline being part of the Schlitz Brewing Company, opened the structure as a real estate investment for as rental units for flats above and as a storefront below. But primarily, the storefront was to be used as a saloon to sell Schlitz beer. This being one of the early examples of this type of structure that the Schlitz Brewing Company established in Chicago. And do we know when the building um, was constructed and uh, how long it operated as a saloon? Well, with the permit having been issued in 1892, construction would have begun presumably after that time. And it was likely completed either in 1892 or in 1893. The brewery or rather the saloon would have existed in this structure certainly through the 1890s and at least through the 1910s, there was a, a newspaper article note, noted in the designation report from 1916 that states that the saloon owners at the time were cited in their permit for operating saloon was revoked. So at least certainly by 1916, there was a saloon there and likely probably at least through 1920 at the beginning of prohibition. Understood. Can you just um, walk us through some of the features on 1399? Um, we'll start with this photograph. You can just, if you could tell us what um, elevation of the building we're looking at and what the features we can see on the building are. Certainly. These two photographs are the Loomis Street elevation, the west elevation of the building. The building itself is of course a four story structure, primarily clad on the west elevation with red pressed brick and detailed with carved stone lintels and window sills around the fenestration. It is regularly fenestrated with a series of windows at all levels, but most prominently, the building is accentuated with two bays, a corner bay, a rounded corner bay and turret, and a box bay on the side, both of which are clad in copper, which has been elaborately detailed, and in my opinion, is some of the more elaborate copper work that I've seen in a building, at least in Chicago. The roof line then terminates in a modern capping of copper, but would have had something similar to that likely in the past. And of course, beyond that, arising above the parapet and the roof line are a series of chimneys. Understood. Um, and I've got a few more pictures here. Could Would you mind telling us um, the same thing, but from this other side of the, the building? Yes, the top left image is a view looking west along Lake Street beneath the elevated tracks. Looking at the east elevation of the building, visible in this photograph is the ghost sign, the Schlitz Brewing Company sign that was painted on the brickwork and remarkably still stands and still exists in, on the brickwork. The photograph below it in the lower left is of the north elevation showing the car limestone above the storefront on the second, third, and fourth floors of the building. A portion of the bay window, the corner turret is also visible. The image on the right is, or yes, the image on the right is also of the north elevation and shows more clearly the ground floor storefront and also the, the corner turret. And I think we have one more um, just to, for features of you to describe to the building. Again, the upper left photograph is of the storefront entrance, which is on the corner of the building. And it shows the, a cast iron column, which supports three copper brackets that then, of course, support the rounded bay on the upper floors. The storefront was, of course, altered in the 1930s, but was altered many times thereafter. And currently, this current iteration of the storefront dates, I believe, to the 1990s when the Luce restaurant transformed the building into a restaurant space. The, build, the photograph in the lower left is a detail of the copper work on the bay. There are some panels that were replaced, likely when La Luce re renovated the building. It appears that they spent some extra funds on replacing some missing architectural elements, but instead of replacing all of the detailed panel work that likely existed around the bay's cladding, they instead replaced it with flat panels of copper, which in time will have the same patina as the rest of the building. And of course, finally, the large last image on the right is a detail of the very top, the fourth floor level of the corner bay with its bracketed cornice, the folia panels that are below the brackets, and then details of the copper pressed paneling that clad the bay itself. And just for architectural layman like me, that's because copper starts one color and becomes green over time, is that right? 
this is correct. Copper oxidizes naturally over the course of decades. The current copper work, if it dates to the 1990s or 2000s, will likely take at least a few more decades to turn anywhere near a nice green as we have on the rest of the building. Understood. Um, oh, we do have one more photo of the, of I believe, the bay windows in the storefront. Would you mind describing the features here for us? Of course. The left photograph is of the upper floors of the box bay. It shows a series of pressed panels pressed rosette panels along the base of the site of the third floor, as well as a frame of copper work that surrounds the third floor windows, which is then surmounted by a wonderful copper fan detail with an arched top. This type of wood, this type of window hood and, and fan detail is very, it's very special to this building, quite unique in its architectural detail, especially having been executed exclusively in copper. The next photo on the right is our, the cast iron storefront detail of the, on the north elevation. And it shows the, this cloth entrance is now gone, but this would have been the doorway to the upper floor flats. Understood. And the fan detail you mentioned and the detailing around the storefront, um, are those uh, original? The fan detail around the third floor of the box bay on the west elevation is original, as is all of the copper cladding above the second floor line of the box bay on the west side of that box bay. All of that cladding is original, and it's also interesting because it features a series of patterns and varied textures and elements that are part of the Queen Anne style and kind of exhibit this eclecticism of historical styles that were combined together to create this new American format that this building so clearly represents. Great. Um, I'm going to skip us through this history since I think it's been well trod at this point. Um, you mentioned an article a moment ago about uh, the license being revoked. Is that um, the one on the right hand of the screen here? Yes, that is correct. And again, we have the on the lower left, you indicated that that's where the uh, ghost sign is on the building, correct? Correct, at the fourth floor level of the east elevation. Great. Um, based on your review of the history and the history we've discussed and the DPD presented today, have you formed an opinion about whether the building meets criteria one under the landmark code having a heritage value for the city, state, and country? Yes, I believe that this particular building represents, as is noted well in the report, the structure does represent the Tide House style of building, which was really came into its own during the 1890s in Chicago as this particular building format. But more importantly, it is as having served as a saloon and corner Tide House, it is representative of the movement and transformation of the brewing industry into this larger context where they not only brewed the beer, but also were able to sell it in the neighborhood exclusively at their own retail establishments, which they also owned. The building then ties into themes related to the, the rise of prohibition and how people were then against the, the proliferation of tide houses, saloons, and taverns within residential and commercial areas of the city. It's been seen as a great social ill. It has also themes that are tied to the development and establishment of immigrant neighborhoods within Chicago, which then ties directly into the development and history of Chicago's Chicago's neighborhoods on their own. The, the building itself really ties into multiple themes that are significant in Chicago's history, both economic, socially, and culturally. And are there, excuse me, are there individual features of this building that, that exemplify this, this heritage value, or is it more just the building itself? In this case, it is more the building itself. In my opinion, this structure, although it does say Schlitz on the side on the east elevation, and it is a fine example of a Queen Anne building, Queen Anne style building. This particular structure is more significant for its direct historical association and connection borne out through extensive research with the brewing company, specifically with the Schlitz Brewing Company. Understood. Um, I want to talk briefly about uh, the features in Tide Houses, which have been discussed a little bit today. Could you tell us um, briefly about the location that was generally picked out for these, this type of building? Tide houses built by Schlitz and others were especially given prominent locations on corners. These structures such as 1944 West Oakley and also the structure at Damon and Division, or rather this structure here at Armitage on Armitage were 
on corner locations, but especially along larger commercial corridors with secondary side streets and sometimes larger commercial secondary streets as well. These buildings were not always built on corners. Many examples in my research, I did conduct a survey and found over 180 extant and non-extant tied houses that were built for Schlitz. And these buildings were not exclusively built on corners. Many were built mid-block. But it happens that the Uline Company or Uline and the Schlitz Brewing Company did actively pursue corner locations because they were pro more prominent and were more visible to the neighborhood residents that might be clients or customers of their particular brand of beer. And uh, can you tell us briefly about the materials that were used in the construction of these tied house buildings? As with any building type in Chicago, tied houses were built in a range of materials and a range of sizes as well. But materially, the examples on this slide are all buildings that were unique in their own right because they were clad on their main elevations in limestone, while their secondary elevations were clad in brick. Many structures built for Schlitz were either entirely clad in brick or entirely clad in limestone. And there are also examples of structures that were built entirely out of wood. And uh, could you tell us a little bit about the height and format of tied houses generally? Tied houses that were built for Schlitz in my, through my survey, I determined that many were built either as one and a half story frame buildings, one story structures, the vast majority, especially those built after about 1897, were constructed on a two-story plan, often with a one-story rear extension. And then there are also examples of three-story tide flats, uh, such as the image on the right, which is of 1870 South Blue Island. And there are also examples of four-story structures. Those were primarily, the larger ones were primarily built before about 1897. And, um... We talked earlier about the, the ghost sign. Could you talk a little bit about the Schlitz branding that was present both on the earlier version of these buildings and later? Yes, the Schlitz sign, as was noted during the in the DPD report, but also looking at these buildings constructed over time, the Schlitz logo, as we have come to know it today, especially most, most prominently the belted globe, was not a prominent architectural element that was used on their structures until at least the latter half of the 1890s, but more especially, or more significantly in the early 1900s. Prior to that time, in the early 1890s, but also in the 1900s, many of Schlitz's buildings were simply identified through painted signs. These painted signs, such as in the example of 235 North Ashland on the corner, southeast corner of Fulton, had painted signs on their secondary or even their primary elevations. And they simply said Schlitz. Later on, there were taglines and logos that were added to that. Many of the frame buildings that were built by Schlitz only had painted signs on the sides of their buildings. Around 1900, there was a drive to add stained glass windows as well, which often had the belt of globe built into them, but those were often added later into structures that Schlitz owned and built. And uh, lastly, uh, can you talk a little about the architecture or um, ornament that was used in the construction of these buildings? So Schlitz, many of their structures are fairly plain, but many, large, several of their other buildings, their two-story tight houses, three-story and four-story buildings, in addition to their one-story structures. Borrow one three seven five four eight on a five-year note. Oh, so Mr. Like, Johnny, Mr. Johnny. 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 So I said, you can take it. Yanni or Janini? Oh, there you go. Sorry about that. So many of the buildings that were designed for Schlitz often included a range of architectural styles. There's the German Renaissance, which has been mentioned several times, especially for buildings along the Southport Corridor. There are also structures that were designed in the Queen Anne, very popular, especially in the 1890s. But the architecture and ornament of these buildings representing these architectural styles they tried to use materials, they tried to use ornament in a means, in a way to, to show that the could be commercial block, that these were not obtrusive structures to be feared, but these were not obtrusive uses to be feared. They were meant to essentially humanize and bring the saloon atmosphere, this thing that the dry movement attempted to, wanted to remove from the city landscape, or at least 
limit, these structures were ornamented in such a way that they made the buildings more visually appealing to the masses, to the people, to the public, and therefore potentially could have more of a, a significant place within the context of local commercial quarters within neighborhoods. Understood. Um, I'm going to skip forward a bit. Uh, the, the, the elements we've been discussing um, about what goes into making a tide hose, are those present in 1393 through 1399 West Lake? There are several common features in 1393 to 1399 West Lake that were employed on tide houses across the city. It happens to have a corner location, although this is not exclusive to tide houses. There were tide houses that were built mid block. It happens to have a corner saloon or a store location as well. And it also happens to be in the architectural style of the Queen Anne. But these happen to be more features of this building, but are not exclusive features of the Tide House building style. Understood. Um, and have you formed an opinion as to whether the building uh, meets or whether the building's features meet criterion six, which is uh, exhibiting a distinctive architectural, cultural, economic theme um, for the city? As a building that combines both the fact that it was a tied house and also the Queen Anne architectural style and other characteristics of is it being a corner building and a larger example of the Schlitz building type, it fits within the theme primarily historically as a representative structure at the earlier end of the construction spectrum for Schlitz Brewing Company's tied houses in Chicago. It is within the theme of being a Schlitz tied house in Chicago. And what are the elements, um, if any, in this photo that we can see that um, add to that theme or are consistent with that theme? Well, in comparison to other extant and non-extant tide houses in the city, those that have been landmarked and those that have not, it does share the common that characteristic of being on a corner. It does share the common characteristic of having a corner bay and architectural detail that is perhaps a little bit more expensive and a little bit more elaborate than other store corner store buildings of the time, or at least on par with those types of buildings. It also happens to have a corner storefront entrance and a larger ground floor retail space that was leased out as a saloon. Um, is, is there anything about the materials that renders it consistent with these? The use of brick, the use of limestone on the main elevation are also consistent with the, with at least certainly two of the landmark tide houses in Chicago. But the use of brick is, in, especially in contrast with limestone, and also in contrast now here with copper work, is a consistent theme, not only within the Queen Anne architectural style, but also in forming this building that stands out in the public's imagination, and also in a commercial district to simplify, or not simplify, but rather to make the saloon a more appreciable use on the commercial street. And uh, what effect, if any, would demolishing the building have on these uh, features that we've been discussing that are consistent with that theme? Well, it would be my opinion that if the building were torn down, it would not exist. Consequently, all of the features would be lost and its contribution to the city's heritage, its contribution as an extant tight house, and its contribution as a distinctive theme or within the city would be lost. And I just want to briefly, before we close, talk about um, Queen Anne style. Um, can you indicate for us what the, you know, very generally what the attributes of the Queen Anne style are and how they're present, if, if they are present on the face of this building? Yes, the Queen Anne style is often seen as a, an eclectic style, one that has plenty of asymmetry. In this case, there is the asymmetrical orientation of the building with a corner bay on its northwest corner and a longer elevation with box bay. There is a contrast between different types of materials. Here we have copper, we have limestone, we have red pressed brick. We also have cast iron elements on the storefront. In addition to that, there is also the contrast in patterns and many different types of patterns that next to each other create a textural experience or characterize the building in a certain way that 
just enlivens it, unlike other architectural styles of the time that might have had more uniform architectural ornament. In this case, there are various patterns that are represented along the cornice line, below the cornice, within the pattern work that clads the box bays as well, and of course the ornament and decoration, the use of rosettes, the use of projecting piers and beams uh, around the storefront and around the windows and the use of window hoods. These are all architectural elements that stand out with as part of being within the realm of the Queen Anne. Of course, the Queen Anne architectural style is a larger spectrum that encapsulates many finer elements and many other subgenres of architectural styles. But within this, generally, this building and these features, these materials and these contrasts, show it as an example of the Queen Anne. Thank you. And is that the same as um, the, the other elevation as well? Does it also display those features? Yes, the north elevation also clearly exhibits these features in the form of contrasting materials. There's the clash of the copper work on the bay and on the corners with the main elevation of the, the north elevation's limestone. The limestone itself also has a variety of features. You have arched lunettes above the windows that have richly carved fan details, in addition to the interplay between smooth limestone banding above the storefront and also on the window sills compared with the rusticated stonework of the main elevations cladding. All these textures and materials really give the building a, a, a richer appearance and were more costly in the end to construct for this particular type of building. Great. I just want to bring up something that came up in the exchange of documents between the party. This building at 2001 West Division, um, we had, this was initially thought to be a tide house, correct? Yes, that is correct. But what is the actual case with this one? This building was in fact not an actual tide house built for the Schlitz Brewing Company. Instead, it is a fine example of the Queen Anne style built for another occupant, another tenant in the 1880s. The actual Schlitz Brewing Company tavern tide house is no longer extant at this intersection, but was built on the northeast corner of this intersection at I believe 1958, 1956 to 1958 West Division. Understood. That permit was in 1891. Um, have you formed an opinion about whether the Queen Anne elements we've been discussing represent an exemplification of that architectural type in the city? I believe that the architectural elements and the especially the use of copper work as opposed to galvanized metal or other types of pressed tin, in addition to the use of rusticated limestone on the main north elevation, all reveal a more intricate and perhaps a slightly more expensive variation of the more common corner Queen Anne style store and flats building. This one stands out especially for its use in its copper work and materials and is also it's called out even in the city's historic resources survey as having been significant specifically for its architectural features and the use of its copper cladding. So this building, it wasn't coated orange because of its Tide House Association. It was coated orange because of its architectural uh, significance. Is that right? It is my understanding from the Historic Resources Survey that this particular building, although it was noted that the Schlitz sign was painted on the east elevation, it was especially notable for its extensive copper work, which at the time had not yet been repaired. There were significant portions of the now replaced copper work that at the time when it was listed as orange were simply painted sheet metal, common galvanized metal used in other types of buildings across the city. Understood. Um, and lastly, uh, before I leave that slide, actually, what, what effect would demolishing the building have on these features we've been discussing? It would thoroughly eliminate this particular building and its features from the landscape. So it would have a per se effect, negative effect. And, and lastly, what what are the, we talked a little bit about the alterations to this building, but could you summarize briefly what they are and whether they affect the presentation of the significant architectural features of the building? Yes, the building has a series of alterations that were conducted over the last 100 years of its standing at this intersection. Most prominently, the copper cladding on the bay has been replaced. It has been replaced at least once with sheet metal and then more recently with copper work. However, a significant portion of the copper cladding on the box bay and on the round 
corner turret remain and could essentially be used in the future if needed to replicate and to replace missing portions. However, the current copper work on the bay, the replaced copper work does not detract or significantly diminish the building's integrity architecturally. Similarly, there, the storefront was altered in the 1930s and again throughout history. I think by the 1980s, it was nearly largely filled in and had much smaller windows. When it was restored and opened in the 1990s or early 2000s for the Luce restaurant, the, um, that the current storefront is, dates to that particular time period. However, the alterations over time, given that the cast iron piers on the east elevation, on the west elevation, and on the north elevation remain, in addition to the cast iron column, the corner entrance, large copper brackets beneath the corner turret remain, these elements are still part of that storefront. And I do not feel that the alterations given over the last 100 years to this particular feature detract from it either. There are also a few other elevation changes. There's some copper cladding along the cornice line that was replaced and above along the parapet that has been changed as well. But these similarly do not detract. There are some newer features that were added to the building, perhaps to make it look a little bit more historic when La Luce moved in there. That specifically was a weather vane that is no longer extant on the top of the turret. And I believe a terracotta finial at the south end of the west elevation of the parapet level. However, this would have originally been um, that would not have been on this building. But it is easily removable and similarly it does not detract from the building's architectural style or its ability to show this particular architectural style. Um, understood. I don't have anything further. So thank you very much for your testimony, Mr. Wickland. Thank you both. Um, does the applicant wish to cross-examine the witness? You are muted. So um, <laughs> sorry, I have such a bad eye infection. I'm trying to make it through here. Um, I actually don't have any direct questions for Mr. Wickland, though I do um, extend my gratitude for his presentation. It was quite thorough and meaningful. Um, I would, however, um, after other questions are heard, I would like to put Mr. Kissel back on for rebuttal. Okay. Um, I guess that 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 brings us to the next point. Um, does that conclude uh, um, the city? Any more questions? Any more points to bring up? No, we have uh, no other witnesses, and we'll um, just reserve our time for uh, closing argument. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, and then, um, does the applicant wish to present rebuttal evidence or testimony? Um, sorry, sorry, having a hard time hearing you. Uh, but I oh, think. I'm sorry. Can uh, you just identify yourself once more for the record? Certainly. My name is George Kissel, president of Oak Ridge Kissel Associates, offices at 122 South Michigan in Chicago. Okay. Um, thank you again, Mr. Kissel. And you've been sworn in and you are still operating under um, that oath, that same oath. Um, with that, we just heard some testimony from Mr. Wickland um, that addresses several of the criteria, not just for landmarking, but also with regard to the orange rating of the existing building. Um, in your experience, 40 years of experience um, with architecture and land use here in the city, have you ever observed a situation where a building is either totally demolished or portions thereof are demolished and some of the historical features are reincorporated into a new development or a new building? Uh, yeah, a couple kind of prominent ones come to mind. Um, so the, the uh, high rise, it was built by Solomon Cordwell and Benz behind the cultural center. On the east side of Wabash, the storefronts were uh, replicated and restored adjacent to the parking structure that serves that building. Um, another prominent one downtown is the corner of LaSalle and Madison where the uh, prior existing sort of ground base of the building was preserved and a, a new modern high rise was constructed on top of it. 
I'm sure there are others in the city. Uh, the, the term facadectomy is one that's used sort of quite a bit uh, as a term of art in, uh, in, in the industry. But uh, those are the, the two first ones that come to mind for me. And even in this same Fulton Market District, their, um, the new restaurant Nobu and Hotel, they also incorporated some of the features of the Tyler building, is that right? Yeah, in that case, like some of the historic features. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure it's quite qualifies as historic, but certainly uh, significant artistically. There was a uh, uh, a Banksy uh, work that was uh, placed on what was a, the parting wall of the demolished building on the Nobu site, and that was incorporated, I believe, into their bar uh, in the design of their bar. Thank you. Um, and with regard to some of the renovations that were done to the subject building in the 1990s, which you also observed in your report. Um, it's true that the previous owners did, uh, as Mr. Wickland also um, acknowledged, made some renovations to the copper work that was that's on the building. Is that right? Yeah, that's true. Um, and so with that, and with regard to the ghost sign, since it's become a popular subject, again, a, a ghost sign is another term for a painted wall sign. Is that right? Correct, yes. Um, and is it your expert opinion as, again, an architect, a licensed architect, is it your opinion that a, a painted wall sign is not an architectural feature? Uh, no, in my opinion, that's not an architectural feature, and nor is nor it would be cause to uh, uh, landmark a structure. And um, with regard to the brick and limestone materials, um, again, those weren't distinctive of tide houses, but you found such same detailing and materials in the two hundred other Queen's Anne um, style architecture buildings that were a part of your analysis. Is that right? Yes, that's true. And, and, uh, just a quick comment on the on the use of copper. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the eighteen late eighteen eighties, uh, early nineteen nineties, uh, there was a lot of technological advances. One, there was a lot of technological advances in uh, the building arts, also. And one of them was uh, there was a lot of manufactured building parts, pressed metal being one of them. Um, in fact, there was a movement at the time that looked down upon buildings that used materials like pressed metal. In terracotta because they were uh, basically cheaper and uh, less durable versions of what would normally have been either carved in stone or rendered with the skill of, uh, of you know, uh, talented masons. So, you know, while we do understand in this period and at this day and age, that looks like something that represents uh, significant craftsmanship in, in terms of individual works, the fact of the matter, these were manu manufactured pieces that uh, you know, architects and builders pulled from catalogs. And towards that end, it would be, you would be able to replicate that and or even again, take those features that copper work um, from the building, from the existing building and reutilize that in any sort of new building or new development, is that right? That's certainly the case, especially with newer technologies and, and the ability to, uh, uh, you know, using uh, CAD and computer aided manufacturing, um, you know, designing one offs uh, and, and manufacturing one offs is no longer as cost prohibitive as it had been in the past. And certainly, this same type of brick and limestone is still available um, for con new construction. Is that right? Uh, very reasonable facsimiles, yes. So, then, um, Mr. Um, Kissel, is it uh, once more, can you just affirm that it is your opinion um, that the features that have been discussed and described herein, both by you and Mr. Wickland, that demolition of the building would not thoroughly eliminate these architectural features from the streetscape and that they could be incorporated back into any type of new development? They could, yes. Thank you. So then, um, Finally, the demolition of the building would not have an adverse impact. It's potentially that it would not have an adverse impact, yes. Thank you, thank you. Um, I don't have any further questions. Uh, Council Wilson, if you wish to redirect on, on Mr. Kissel, please. 
I just have a few with the commissioner's indulgence. Um, I ha Have you reviewed, Mr. Kissel, any specific plans for uh, a so-called facadectomy or reincorporation of any elements into a new building? Um, I think in my office, I do have the plans for the, uh, the building at uh, uh, Randolph and, and Wabash, yeah. Uh, what about specific to this building, to 1399? No, I don't have any specific uh, uh, plans or, or uh, uh, construction documents related to the subject property, no. Um, and it's true that in the event of a total demolition, even if some elements are retained, um, the remainder of the building uh, would be presumably gone, correct? Well, that's kind of inherent in the word demolition. And you mentioned that certain materials um, related to the building, such as pressed copper and um, other elements are, are readily available today. Is that correct? Well, they could easily be replicated. I I'm not quite sure they would be readily available. Understood. I know copper is expensive these days. <laughs> um, Everything is expensive these days. This is a, an unprecedented time, as we say, particularly in the construction industry. Understood. Um, that was all my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Um, does the applicant uh, wish to redirect it all? I'm sorry, I didn't hear well, I'm you. I'm sorry, I have no further questions. Okay. Thank okay. you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, um, at this time, we'll um, hear statements from the public, both for and against the permit application, statements from the public are expressions of opinion. Individuals making statements are not parties or expert witnesses. They are not speaking under oath and are not subject to cross-examination. Uh, per the emergency rules, anyone wishing to make a statement regarding the proposed permit application must have submitted their appearance forms via email no later than 48 hours prior to the commencement of the public hearing. Please keep your statements brief, um, approximately three minutes and do not repeat information previously given. Feel free um, to simply state your name, address, the organization you represent, if any, and whether you support or oppose uh, the permit applications. The commission also accepts written comment on the subject of the public hearing from non-party members of the public um, up to 24 hours prior to the scheduled commencement of the public hearing. Any written comments received have been posted on the commission's website and are available for viewing at chicago.gov ccl. These comments are deemed incorporated into the record. We have received two appearance forms, uh, both in opposition to the permit application. Uh, first, can we please hear from Ward Miller? Uh, can you hear me now? Commissioner? Yes, we can. All right. Uh, Ward Miller with Preservation Chicago. Uh, we already gave testimony, but for the record, we oppose the demolition of this uh, historic building uh, at uh, 1399 West uh, Lake Street. And um, we have quite a few uh, signatures through a change.org petition, over 8,200 um, Chicago citizens and people from around the country that uh, support the landmark designation and preservation of this orange rated building. Um, we also saw images that we could not use uh, of the uh, belted uh, globe sign on the east wall of the building um, th that adjoined the Schlitz logo. Uh, we were not able due to COVID restrictions uh, to capture that ourselves from the train uh, platform, but that is further evidence that this was a Schlitz Tide House or, or marketed Schlitz beer. Um, the, the paper documents all represent that uh, Edward Uline was involved in the purchase uh, of this building and the construction of this building. We find this to be an, an, uh, an exemplary example of, of a Schlitz Tide House. The reason for it not having the typical belted globe on its uh, facades was, was perhaps due to the fact that this was not a popular uh, logo at the time of the Billings construction, which was a year before the Chicago World's Fair where the uh, belted globe was introduced in a highly visible location and became um, really sort of aligned with Schlitz Brewing uh, Company. So we are of the opinion that this is a highly remarkable building. Uh, when I was out uh, photographing the building, uh, 
when it was still threatened with demolition, numerous tradespeople, uh, a, a woman from a FedEx van, all thought it was just terrible that this remarkable building was threatened with demolition. And uh, they all supported the idea of landmarking this really beautiful structure. The general public feels that this is a remarkable structure that should be landmarked. All 8,200 people that signed our change.org petition. And that was done in response to public outcry. So we very much support the Chicago landmark designation and denying the demolition permit. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Uh, we did have one more person signed up, but I don't believe uh, Diane Gonzalez is here at, anymore. Um, but we did hear from her in part one. Um, so I think that concludes um, the public uh, comment. Um, we'll now hear closing statements from the parties. Um, please limit your statements to five minutes. And first we'll, we'll hear from the applicant. I can't hear you, Miss Barnes. This is a court oh, reporter. I'm sorry, um, court reporter. Um, again, Sarah Barnes for the record. I'm going to keep my statements hopefully shorter than a minute or two, simply because I feel like a lot has been said here today and it's all been incorporated into the record and for brevity and the sake of um, everybody's day, I'll keep it short. Um, with that, I just want to reiterate the applicant's willingness to continue to work with the Department of Planning and Development towards programming that would allow for the retention and reuse of the materials and some of these historic features on the building into any new development that's been the intent the whole time. The only reason that there's no plans yet um, put forth by the applicant is because of the expedited basis of these proceedings. It had to turn all of its attention from being able to um, use the property as it had initially intended in purchasing the property. And that was towards, again, a redevelopment that would be consistent with the Fulton Market Innovative District, Innovation District and its incentives um, and had to move its efforts towards, again, um, defending this action. So it is the intent and the commitment of the applicant to continue to work with the Department of Planning and Development and its staff, and in particular, the staff at the Historic Preservation Division towards, again, making sure to retain um, and maintain and preserve the historical elements of the building, even though we feel that they don't, do not raise to the level of an individual landmark designation. Um, and that we believe can be done even if a demolition permit is issued um, and it could. And so we will continue uh, that commitment uh, towards that end. It is our opinion um, that the demolition permit would not have an adverse impact on historical features or the street, streetscape. Um, and we would just very once more respectfully request that issuance of the demolition permit um, pursue, be pursued and in stanter. And as well, actually that's it with that, um, I'm happy to close and I, we stand on our prior um, arguments on the landmark designation. Great, uh, thank you. And uh, now we'll hear uh, from the city in closing statement. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I'll also try to be brief. Um, the department respectfully submits that the evidence before the commission, before the hearing officer today, shows that the application for a demolition permit should be denied because demolition would have a per se effect on the significant historical and architectural features of this building. Um, just to go through the factors very briefly, because I know they're well trod at this point. Uh, factor one, which asks whether the building has heritage value for the city. There's really no dispute in this case that that factor is met. Mr. Kissel's report um, admits on page 14 that the building satisfies criteria one. And that's no surprise considering the evidence showing that the Tide House was in fact in operation in the latter part of the 1890s. 
Um, criteria six, whether the building is an example of its distinctive theme, that's satisfied here as well. We saw evidence today that all of the elements present in a tied house, including its select its location at the corner of a busy street, um, the materials used in its construction, its size, its shape, the branding present on the wall are all present in this building and they're all consistent with the other tied houses, both landmarked and um, discovered throughout the city. Uh, respectfully, we believe that the evidence that the applicant has submitted does not prove otherwise. Um, the fact that this is on one busy street as opposed to two does not distinguish it from several other tied houses in the city. And the fact that it is uh, two, uh, four floors instead of two also does not make it particularly unique. Um, the more, as, as the testimony showed, the more common ones were two floors, but a four floor one is certainly not unheard of and does not you know, disqualify it from designation. Uh, we also contest the idea that the, this building does not qualify because it lacks visual association with a brewery uh, because of the lack of the Schlitz globe that's imprinted on several other landmark buildings. I, I would disagree with this argument factually. 1399 is visually recognizable as a former Tide House. The, there's the ghost sign that's visible on the second floor that associates the property with Schlitz um, and the materials and the location and the ornament and the size all contribute to visually suggest that this was in fact a brewery tide house, which is confirmed by its history. It even has the corner entrance and corner turret that have been indicated as two of the factors that convey the historic aspect of a tide house. But sort of uh, on a higher level, the department believes that requiring a specific visual association is too narrow of a reading of the landmark requirements. Um, a building doesn't have to be visually identifiable as a tight house to be a good example of the fact that it was in the building's history. Uh, just like other landmark factors, such as whether a building was constructed by a particular architect or whether a famous Chicagoan lived in the building, these are factors that are uncovered with research and with uh, the sort of research that both experts in this case have extensively undertaken. And so the fact that you know there may not be as much of a visual association is not a strong indicator that it should not, that its features should not be recognized as representing tied houses throughout the city. And then lastly, uh, we believe the evidence shows that the building independently qualifies under criteria four as an excellent example of the Queen Anne style architecture. As Mr. Wickland described, the various features, the contrasting elements, the um, ornament work around the turret and bay windows, and all of the other elements that go into the overall impression of the building represent an excellent example of Queen Anne style and one that landed it on as an orange on the historic survey in the first place. Um, lastly, the integrity of the building, uh, as the testimony showed, where the, while there have been some revisions, the evidence shows that they do not detract from the overall quality of this building and they would be readily reversible even if they did. Uh, these kind of minor revisions over time do not preclude landmark designation. Um, I know the expert reports in this case have cited other examples that have undergone similar work and uh, still maintain their historic integrity, such as the uh, building at 825 West Armitage, which was highlighted um, during the proceedings. And just very briefly before I conclude, I want to touch on this idea that um, reincorporation or a facadectomy would be um, you know, that would that would not cause an adverse effect. First of all, demolition is a per se adverse effect under the commission's rules. So it, it, factually, it's, it doesn't matter whether there are plans in the future to reincorporate demolished elements. Um, that's not before the commission. And as far as the law is concerned, uh, demolition is a per se adverse effect. And it's even more appropriate in this inappropriate in this instance because, as Mr. Wickland explained, it's the building itself that is the significant historical and architectural features as an example of Tide House history. So reincorporating those features into a new building would not provide the same historical value. It, it's not the same as putting back up a Banksy wall. This would be a, an entirely different building, um, and we don't believe that it would be the same sort of historical example if it was reincorporated or facadectomy. And again, that sort of plan just isn't before the commission today. So I, I don't believe that that can be adequately weighed. 
and the demolition would just simply have a per se effect and should be denied. So for those reasons, uh, the department asks that the commissioner find that the building and, exterior, and its exterior are significant architectural and historical features worthy of protection and that demolishing the building would destroy those features and that the application should therefore be denied. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Um, the parties may submit draft findings and, and conclusions for my consideration. The deadline for submitting your draft findings and conclusions is Friday, uh, May 21st, 2021 at 4.30 p.m. I will not consider submissions after this time and date. Um, please send one compiled PDF file to the uh, Chicago Landmarks Commission email account, ccl at cityofchicago.org. And this concludes today's public hearing. I will present my recommendations to the commission and commission staff will make the entire record of the hearing available to the full commission for its review, including the transcript of today's hearing. <clears throat> the commission will make a final decision approving or disapproving the permit application at their regular commission um, on Chicago Landmarks meeting on June 3rd, 2021 uh, to be held remotely. This meeting is open to the public and details for participation and listening to the simulcast are available on the commission website at chicago.gov slash CCL. And uh, that concludes the meeting. Thank you all uh, for coming and um, for um, the presentations. Have a good day. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Bye-bye.